Here we go. Hello, all. I'm trying not to say hey, everybody, every week. My guest this week, Mr. F. Reed Shippen. How are you, sir? Hey, everybody. Now, I'd like to, for the audience, the F stands for Frank, but according to some parts of the internet, the F stands for fucktard. Yep. So Always. I want to get the explicit thing going right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, dude, I'm from New Jersey. So, you know, one man's curse word is another man's adjective. Exactly. Exactly. Fucktard. I mean, that's a really lightweight one. You put the tard on the end and it kind of waters it down. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's even in the realm of politically correct anymore, but I, I, I think we can all agree that fuck is the most useful language, useful word in the English language. Absolutely. Absolutely. Inflection. I mean, you can hold that for like 10 seconds and really turn it into something. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And coming from New Jersey, as you do, yeah. it's, it's a whole nother thing. It, it is. And Long Island a lot of and times, New Jersey have this weird like dichotomy <laughs> of using the word fuck. And I grew up on Long Island, so there different. Very yeah. different. So much fun. But look, we're not here to talk about me. We're talk here to talk about you. My so, least favorite subject. Uh, well, you're going to warm up to it, I think. All right. So we're you're joining us from Robot Lemon, which is your studio. Right? It is. And I love that on your website, you say that well robot lemon is really easy to remember and easy to spell and who the hell wouldn't want a robot lemon right i mean yeah that's i think it's like lemons are delicious in gin and tonics which by the way i learned in uh your your adopted home country and uh yeah who doesn't want a robot Let's, no i mean i was expecting that we would have them already right like where are the jet packs like i feel i feel taken advantage yeah of. well all right now let me ask you a question though the is this a robotic lemon or did the robot and the lemon really just have nothing to do with each other? It, honestly, it was just what's something that is impossible to misspell and really easy to remember and available as a domain name. Right. Which, yeah, now more than ever is is like the trick. Right. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but would so, your, no, I mean, it, it didn't mean anything. Would your ideal robot be able to squeeze a lemon into your gin and tonic? My ideal robot would be able to molecularly just construct whatever alcoholic beverage was necessary. So Robbie the robot, basically. Yeah, you absolutely. Have, you've seen Forbidden Planet, right? Oh, yeah. yeah okay, yeah, good. Just absolutely. Check. Yeah, all yeah. right. Good. So as robots go, I'd say he's top of the heap. So I, Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, all right. Thanks for coming, Reed. That was awesome, man. <laughs> thanks for having me. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So look, New Jersey. Yep. Fairhaven. What yep. exit is that? 109. 109. Okay. For people who have not been to Jersey or in the tri-state area, they will not get that small joke, but that's no. okay. Yeah. No. That's all right. So you grew up, you were playing drums, if I have that correct. I kind of started being musically interested in drums and my, uh, my parents who were kind of conservative um, weren't super chuffed about the whole drum thing. Yeah. So they kind of shunted me into piano. Keep in mind, these are the people that when I finally prevailed on them to get me a boom box for Christmas, they, it came with a Burl Ives tape. <laughs> right. So they were, they were, my mom listened to the classical music. My dad was into things like, uh, John Denver and Kingston trio and flat Scruggs and Watson actually, which was pretty amazing. And yeah. somewhere in the closet, I dug up, an eight track tape that was um, Magical Mystery Tour. So. Wow. Yeah, there were always yeah. some outliers in there. What else right. was in the record collection that was like surprising? Um, Simon and Garfunkel, um, you know, which I guess wasn't surprising, but you know, the that early stuff, Sounds of Silence and everything was just so brilliant. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I made a, I made a mess when I taped the penny. This is how old I am. I, you know, I taped the penny to the postcard and got a stack of records, which I still remember to this day and included foreigner records, men at work, uh, journey escape rush, moving pictures, John Mellencamp, American fool, like that stuff. Um, and you know, I remember distinctly sitting on my living room floor playing the first 20 seconds of Tom Sawyer over and over, <laughs> over again, just freaking out because it was so cool. Now, I mean, obviously, that's a lot of the stuff that would have been playing on the radio at the time, too. So you yeah. had some exposure to that stuff, right? Well, I was so I was lucky that I 
grew up just south of New York City because we got all of the New York City radio stuff, which means we got a lot of stuff that was early. Right. Um, you know, and uh, and weird. And, you know, also New Jersey had some alternate rock stations and I was friends with dudes who were into skating. So, you know, like things took a left turn into bad brains, black flag, all descendants stuff, you know, at the same time I'm over here listening to pop and hip hop. Right. And were you playing with people or did the piano thing kind of mess that up for you? Well, the piano thing was kind of uh, a gun to the head sort of situation, which I wasn't particularly enthused about. And um, I, I could play by ear. So I never really learned how to read music. Um, my piano teacher would give me a new piece and play it for me. So I could take it home and figure it out. And when I got stuck, I could just count notes. And so I never learned how to read music. And I quit piano when when she gave me a microcosmos and said, here, you need to learn this. And you know, you you can't you can't <laughs> ear read microtonal. No, she she music. was on to you. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe. <laughs> uh, but I did. I played uh, when I was in high school, I was the lead singer and the and a keyboard, one of the keyboard players in Big Luther and the Where's Your Sister Soul Band. <laughs> and we played like five gigs and mostly it was covers of Taking Care of Business and and uh, and like Journey stuff and, and whatever. So not a lot of soul then, really? No, not a ton of soul, no. It seemed like wow. a good idea for a band name though. Right. Well, maybe. <laughs> no, it was a horrible name, but I mean, you're in high school. What the fuck no, do you No, no, exactly, like, exactly. So, I mean, obviously... The, like that rush album caught your ear in a big way yeah. and that's about that crazy synth sound and the production value of it did that make you start thinking about making records is a thing or like when did you become aware of that as an actual thing i think the first time i actually i don't even know if i became aware of it but the cars did a record with mutt lang called heartbeat city and there was a song on that called Magic, right? Yeah. And the production in that song was deep. Like it was, it's kind of like what, what Tedder talks about where like every four bars, there's a new element and there's all these little interplays and all these little subtleties. And I remember listening to that song like on family road trips, I brought my boom box with a shitload of batteries and my Koss headphones, which hurt, you know, cause they were kind of plastic but they were the big ones. So they actually sounded de decent and listening to that record over and over and over and over again, like crazy. So that's when I think I started deconstructing how you make stuff. Right. Although it never occurred to me that this was a job. And were you, were you just hearing arrangement at that point or were you hearing Sonic stuff that was like making you wonder how the hell you did that? Definitely Sonics, like in retrospect, definitely Sonics. Right. And, and I also really remember my buddy Pete, one of my best friends growing up, he was a really good drummer. And I loved to just sit there and watch him play drums. Like it made me feel awesome. Like I couldn't not smile, like watching that happen. Um, so all those things kind of started to combine in the, uh, in the geek fest that would later become my career after a really bad detour into other things. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about a detour, shall we? Yeah, sure. Um, my parents will never see this. So, um, <laughs> you know, in my in my family, music is a hobby, not a job. In right. fact, I remember my grandmother saying, you know, music is an avocation, not a vocation. Right. So I needed to go get a real job. So I went to college uh, for electrical engineering and uh, business. And um, I uh, I hated it. Like I hated it. Um, and I realized that I just wasn't ever going to be good, good with it at all. Although I do remember the one moment when calculus just went like I was in calculus three or four and all of a sudden it all made sense. And I was like, is that all there is? I remember that moment that's gone now, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that a lot of people never have that moment. So well done. Right. But that was, that was interesting. Right. So, you know, I did two years of business school and, and, and uh, now I will completely embarrass myself. I went and saw a movie called three men and a little lady i think or three men and a baby one of those two movies super schlocky cheesy movie and halfway through that movie i literally got hit with a bolt of lightning i was like why the fuck am i wasting my time in business school what i really want to do is learn how to make records 
So I bailed, which was super scary because I knew it was going to disappoint the crap out of my parents. But I was like, I would rather be poor and interested than secure and bored out of my mind. So, so I went the, looking for recording school. At that point, did you have any sense of what making records was? Did you start like reading credits and looking people up? Or did you find Mix Magazine or REP or anything like that? Or was it still just a big mystery box? It was it was kind of mystery. I mean, I was around enough music. We were a church going family when I was in high school. So I, you know, was sang in the choir and played handbells. And I did as a, as a junior high and high school kid, like musical theater stuff, like Emperor and the Nightingale and Oliver and all that stuff. Um, but only because my family was musical. My grandmother was an opera singer um, as well as a French teacher um, and as well as a very stern woman. But uh, uh, I, I didn't know, I didn't know until I got to recording school that there were magazines for this stuff, right? Right. I had no clue. What I knew was I liked when I was a kid picking up like old radios and like fixing them. And I liked being the AV dork in high school where you, I would build these massive slideshows with like 16 projectors and they would all fade and I would edit the music so it all worked. And like I would do these massive slideshows and stuff like that. So, I mean, I kind of gravitated toward that, not really knowing that there was a career there. Right. Now, just before we get you into recording school, so you grew up one town over from a Mr. Bruce Springsteen, who I happened did. to have an absolutely gigantic hit while you're still living at home. Could you not point to him as an example of someone who had managed to make it a vocation? As a rock star, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I will say, and you know, I don't know, you may have worked with him. Like the nope. boss is like the coolest guy ever. So um, I used to actually go running with him because they built a new park that's my town in Rumson, which is the next town share. We shared a high school, right? Um, and they built a new park. And so I was on the soccer team and we would always go running and he would just join us because it was the nice new running path. Um, nicest guy on the planet. Everybody in town loves him. No, nobody bugs him. He just, you know, he'll walk into whatever club somebody's playing, sit in, play a song, split. Like he's, he's a super sweetheart. Um, but yeah, I mean, dude, born in the USA was so big in Jersey that I distinctly remember driving down the street with my buddy Colin in his Dodge Colt with the windows down and the, the song was on the radio and you could turn the radio off and you could still hear the song because everyone was cranking like Y107 and just playing that song every 10 minutes. It was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was huge. And it's, it is, I guess if you weren't in the Northeast at that point, it's a little hard to understand how much bigger it was there, especially in Jersey especially in jersey especially in our area of jersey where it was just like it was his home yeah so yeah there were a lot of people i mean when i was a kid doing theater it was at the count basie theater where basie had done a lot of his early stuff and bon jovi lived across the street from my high school and Cher lived down the road and like i, I don't know why it was just a bunch of music people right all right so you have this epiphany while watching some high art some or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> something that basically gave you time to think about other things. So it yes. was a good choice of movie. Yes. So you quit business school. Did you like go through it with your parents first or it's like that you just you're doing it? That's it. Yeah, I just I just said I can't I can't I just can't. And there was, you know, much disappointment and gnashing of teeth. Um so then I went on the search for, well, what am I going to do? And, uh, you know, I was like, I want to learn about recording. Uh, so then I, I was on the search for a recording school that I could afford. And was the, there weren't many. was the idea of going to recording school instead of just finding a studio to work at, was that part of the dealing with your parents kind of thing? Or Because for me, I went to University of Miami, I think probably a few years before you were going, but not not that much before and but my parents said you got to get a degree like that was a thing same me. yep yeah okay same. i think that was a that was expected um and i looked at university of miami but i i didn't 
figure I had the chop, the musical chops to get in. That was the bitch of it. You had to be a music yeah. performance major. And I definitely do not have those musical chops. The brass. What faculty, did you, what was your audition? Trumpet. And they fucking hated me. I mean, the brass faculty hated me. You know, when you have, so you may know about this. So like in piano, you didn't really apply yourself. And then for me, I had one semester where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to really work at this this semester. And I practiced my ass off. I played all the time. And then at the end of the semester, you have your jury thing. Exactly the same as every other semester. And like, well, why am I bothering to try? They, they still hate me. They think I haven't practiced. So, you know. <laughs> right. Why bother? <laughs> yeah. No point. No point. Yeah. So, yeah. But that that was brutal. But what it also meant was you had this amazing pool of musicians who wanted to record stuff. Yes. And that must good. have been really... That must have been really awesome. That was great, but so but you ended up at Middle Tennessee State, which was a newer program, but still a pretty pretty good program at that point, right? Yeah, I mean it was it was pretty nascent at that point. Um, you know, I couldn't. I knew I wasn't going to get into Berkeley. I knew I wasn't going to get into U Miami. Um, uh, I don't know how many. There weren't a ton of options for recording schools. Those were, right? I mean, mid eighties. Those were the only two four year programs. Period, in the country. Right. So, wow, that's crazy. Well, so, and, and I, I'm, you know, I've blocked large chunks of my childhood out, but I'm pretty sure that this conversation did center around a, where you're going to get a degree, right? So off to MTSU, I went. The, the advantage to going to a school where the program hadn't really gotten legs yet was there weren't a ton of us in right. the program. So my strategy was okay we got to book the studios in four hour blocks so i knew if i booked the studio from like eight to midnight people would probably not come in from midnight to eight right so i could get 12 hours of uninterrupted time without burning all my studio blocks and then i made friends with the guys in the maintenance department and got the keys so i was just i literally just lived in the studio right i did not get good grades <laughs> but but you did get not only the music tech degree, but also you finished your business degree. Was that because you managed to transfer in all the business stuff you'd already done? Or why did you yeah. continue on the business thing? They required us to have a minor or whatever anyway. And I had brought in like, you know, accounting and all of that stuff. And I figured knowing business was probably a good idea because at some point you're going to have to know that shit. So yeah, that's how I ended up with those. And I would imagine now you would highly recommend that for anybody trying to get into this i i you know i talk to students of fair amount and, and i tell them like don't go to school for recording go to school for if you're going to go to school go to school for something else and then go in, intern you know for recording like if you if I, I say this a lot like if you love what andrew sheps does my advice to a student who really does is to go and this is probably bad advice, and, and I'm sorry if I, this creates problems for you, but I was like, go, just go sit on the stoop of his studio and just say, I am here, I'm here to be your intern. And you might sit out there like Fight Club for like four days. Who cares? Clean the bathroom with a toothbrush. Who cares? Anything you can do to get in with someone who you really respect and work your ass off. Well, let me just clarify, though, because if someone shows up at my house to do that, to shoot him. <laughs> I will say get off my land. <laughs> I don't own yeah. a gun, but you know, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. But I think, well, and you tell me what you think, because I'm actually really glad that I went to school for it, to be honest, because I think there are a lot of real fundamental things that you'd already been going to school for electrical engineering. So, like, I love the electrical engineering bit that I got doing it, but you'd already had that. But just the idea that things are knowable to learn enough of the science behind the acoustics and the electronics and the physics to not think that Fairchilds are full of unicorn poop, that it's electronics. And there's a reason they sound amazing. And yes, they are better than other things at certain things, but it's not because they're made out of magic. So just for me, that's, that's good, a little bit. Well, I just took yeah. mine off the mix bus on this song, by the way, because it was a little too much magic. See? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I think the thing that school taught me the most was learning how to learn, um, yeah. learning how to apply scientific method, especially as an assistant. Like, 
I could figure out really complex weirdnesses in the studio really fast because school taught me how to just do it in a logical order, which is the only way you can do it um, and actually succeed. Like you might get lucky, but like running it from, okay, well, this thing, it starts the preamp, it says this and it does this and it does this, you know, that was really useful. Um, the acoustic, like the stuff that you're supposed to know and this is probably why I didn't get good grades. I don't know that a lot of that stuck. Um, I can't have a really detailed conversation about acoustics. Well, but let uh, me ask you this. When you're tracking and you yeah. walk into a room, don't you, I mean, how often do you totally mess up your mic placement and have to go out and like, oh shit, I got to redo this. Just oh, walking yeah, into a room. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Zero. But the, you know, that, but, that's, but that's I mean, and I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that's because you're doing formulas in your head to figure things out. But it's because I think you start when you've got the knowledge of the underpinnings, you can actually start to visualize the sonic properties of like what that microphone is going to do, and like, oh man, I'm near the glass on that. That could be cool, or that could be bad, or whatever. Whereas if you really don't understand room modes and reflections and you've never even been introduced to the concept of it, you get yourself into trouble. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely, that's definitely true. Although at some point we will probably have a conversation about how many mics do you put on a drum kit? Um, but, uh, when you approach tracking, do you think of like rule of third stuff or, no. Um, you know, yeah. No, I don't I don't consciously go through the rules, but I am convinced that they are part of my natural process now. And obviously it's also it's just practice. I mean, when I started recording, constantly moving microphones. I haven't moved a microphone in years. You push up yeah. the fader and you know you're gonna be able to do something with it, unless there's yeah. a real problem. Yeah. Or something really fun you want to do. Yeah. Well, so but while you were at school, dude named John Hill, right? Yes. Let's talk about John Hill for a second. Instrumental. Um, well, so John was John was the teacher that I think everybody liked to hate because he was the hardest. Like he was his classes were hard. He pushed people. Um, and I loved him because I learned the most from John. Um, you know, John was somebody who had really great speakers and would actually listen to stuff and you know and bring it in and, and uh and really critique it and really think about it and and it, it kind of opened my mind and he was also a big classical guy so he got me into aspen music festival where there was a recording program and there was working there before and after and uh man doing a couple seasons at aspen just taught you how to listen to stuff that's you know, my, my ears got so much better after working on classical music. Right. You know, so yeah, John, John was, John was instrumental in, in making me realize like, oh, there's a, there's a craft to this, um, you know, and there's a lot of stuff that you can learn and constantly get better. And I thought that was really exciting. Right. Still got shitty grades in his class because, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I didn't actually find out what my grades were until the, my school asked me back to teach. And they're like, we need your transcript. And they pulled it. And I was like, me and my co-teacher, our, our grades combined are less than my 17-year-old daughter's high school grade right now. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, yeah, you, well, obviously, you're just never going to make it. You right. Because <laughs> that's what that equates to. No question. Yeah. So, I mean, John was, John was always turning me on to brand new music. Uh, and stuff that I mean, he he introduced me to Kevin Gilbert, like Kevin Gilbert's solo record, Thud, which is a virtuosic engineering feat done by a guy who was probably bipolar and just decided to put a fucking Neve and an M49 in his living room and go for it. You know, um, that record is crazy cool sounding like I just, don't actually know it. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Kevin Gilbert. I mean, you know who Kevin is, right? So he was in Tuesday Night Music Club. Right, right, right. Okay. Yes. He's a guitar player. Yeah. He dated Cheryl. Um, he ended up actually committing suicide um, later in, you know, a, a couple years down the road from that. But he made a couple of solo records, some of which didn't get released. But the one that did is called Thud. And uh, I think there's a song. 
I think there's a song, I think goodness gracious is on the playlist that I sent you, but you know, I mean, it, it literally is now that I hear it, it's the sound of a Neve 1064 and a M49 and an LA 2A and that just beautiful, like, like dark, thick, like whatever the hell it is. And he was an amazing player, an amazing musician. So, you know, that blew my mind and, and we listened to all the Massenberg stuff and, right. um, you know, all, all the Steely Dan as, as is required listening and, you know, but it, he taught me how to listen to the music and to the craft of delivering the music. Right. That's great. And I love that he, he got you out of whatever genres you were already listening in too, because I think that's, it's a really important thing to listen wide. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, although I, I feel a little guilty because I feel like the more you work, and this may be different from you, the less I listen to music because I, you know, when you spend, well, of course, I spend 12 hours working on music and then it's like, I don't want to listen to music anymore. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, one of the great <laughs> things about the lockdown for me is I've started doing a lot of uh, sound flow programming. So like writing scripts to control Pro Tools and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that stuff is awesome. But while coding, I could actually listen to music and it's the first time in 30 years. <sighs> yes. Wow. That's so I would, I would make myself have days when I was not going to mix and I was going to do that instead. And I just had lists of shit to listen to. But yeah, it's the first time since I started doing this full time, really. Yeah, it, it that's is amazing. Hard. It's hard, but important. But so while you were at school, did you start interning in some of the Nashville studios while you were still at school or was that all afterwards? I did. No, I, 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 tr I tried to get into the studios as soon as humanly possible right because it was like hey i'm a recording student which means i can intern hi can i intern at your studio like that's i i did that a lot um and i, I was driving back and forth between nashville and murfreesboro which is about a 40 minute drive and you know i did it a, a lot of times at you know four in the morning which nearly led to my demise one one day when i kind of woke up driving and saw a line of stopped cars and had a nice little hundred yard detour into the median, like between the highways and hyperventilated for the next two hours. Like, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I dove into the studios as soon as humanly possible. Would you like to expand on that? Anything in particular, any places that stick out, any people, sessions? This is where I don't yeah. ask you a question, but expect you to talk a lot. No, that's fine. The uh, uh, one of the first was a was a place called Skylab, and it was in this thing called the UA Tower. I forget what floor it was on. It was like the seven or eight floors up. Um, in the basement was another studio called Loud, where they did tons and tons of country stuff. Um, but me being from Jersey, I didn't gravitate towards country music. Like country music to me was like Waylon and Willie and john denver and stuff like you know flat scrubs and watson bluegrass like i i didn't i didn't really know much about country music and it kind of wasn't my taste so i i gravitated toward the other side of stuff that was going on in nashville which was christian right because the christian music where they were doing rock they were doing pop they were doing hip-hop i was like all right this is kind of more my speed um and like i said i grew up in church but skylab was really cool because you looked out over part of the city through the control room the control room glass big trident glass windows you look out that way over the city, the drum rooms over on the left. Nice. So that was really kind of cool. Um, and same as I did with the MTSU studios, I just spent as much time in there as possible, just figuring everything out and trying a ton of stuff. Um, I interned there. I interned at a place called the Salt Mine October Quad, where Lou Gonzalez had a place down here, you know, called Quad. Um you know, I was all over the place um, before I got a I got a break and turned into an assistant. And where was that? That was at Quad. At Quad. Um, yeah, we were working on a project called The Road, which was uh, live shows with really amazing uh, singers. And I, I actually assisted or helped. I was interning with the truck that was recording it. And then we went back and this guy was mixing this guy named J.R., and we had to sync at that point. We had like two analog multi tracks, a 32 track digital, three D88s, like all, and a video machine, and all of this crazy. And, and, you know, people have probably heard this story before, but long story short, 
I was sitting at the back of the room watching them try and lock all this stuff together and failing and just doing the scientific method. Well, if this, then this, if this, then this, if this. And they finally got pissed off and said, all right, we're going to lunch, whatever. And I was like, well, all right, I'm, I'm not hungry. I'm going to stay. And when they got back from lunch, I had the room locked. And I was like, hey, check it out. Boom, hit play <laughs> and everything locked. And they were like, what the fuck? I was like, well, I just thought through this and, you know, I just kind of figured it out. So they finished working a couple of days later. I was like, man, it was really great hanging with you. Let me, thanks for letting me hang on your session. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. You're coming with us. Like you're, you're an assistant now. Let's go. So wow. great. that's how I became an assistant. Synchronization's a big deal. Trina Shoemaker had a great story about watching someone trying to synchronize two tape machines. And like, she finally said, I'll do it. And that was it, <laughs> you know? And that was my yeah, thing. I know. knew synchronizers, you know, like. Yep. Yep. And I learned that at MTSU because we had links, links is in there. And, and, you know, it took a long time to figure that shit out. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when you had video or digital stuff, that's a totally different ball game. Yeah. 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 It got, it got complicated. And, yeah. you know, fortunately we don't have to deal with that now, although our transfer, like our transfer and archival company gets some weird stuff every once in a while. And, you know, it's kind of, it's funny to figure that out and it's funny to talk Catherine through some of those things because she she has no idea about digital sync she's like why is this popping I was like well you have to have a master clock and you know you have to know that this machine won't take a master clock so you got to generate from this machine and then you know blah 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 down the rabbit hole yeah that's all right we we will come back to the fact that you have a an archival and transfer company oh, as, okay. as well as other companies and things I would imagine this is a little bit of your business degree rearing its head. Maybe, yeah. Because you, jugg you juggle a lot of stuff as well as mixing basically everything. So it's... <laughs> I definitely don't mix basically everything. Well, but... you mix a lot. You mix a lot. But let's go, let's go back in the Wayback Machine. So around 92 seems to be when you really like, okay, now you're working in studios, right? Is that Yeah, fair? I mean, I was interning. I, I think the first... I mean, you probably did better research than I. I feel like the first record that I really had like a credit on as a mixer, and I got lucky and I started early, was around 95. Yeah, it came um, out in 96, I think. The the Katie Oslin record seemed to be like the first mixing credit. But you had a bunch of mixing assistant credits with Rick Will. Yes, with the Rickster. So who, let, um, we should hear a little bit about him. passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's gone. He passed away a couple months ago, uh, which sucked. Um, well, so I started my assistant career again as an intern. And the reason why I could intern so much is that my girlfriend had a real job. Right. So, uh, you know, we lived together and she supported us by working at a library. And I, you know, began to do what would eventually be um, incredible damage to our relationship by working 16 hour days, seven days a week. In fact, I, uh, at one point I actually had a ledger where I was keeping track of it and I averaged 16 hours a day, seven days a week for a little over three years as an assistant, um, which is a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I don't remember how I met Rick, but Rick, Rick was a weirdo and ran in a crowd of weirdos that included a guy named Jay Joyce. Um, and Doug Lancio and uh, Chris Pemberton, both of who played and play with Ryan Adams and a whole bunch of other weirdos. And uh, we did the weird records that no one else kind of did. And some of it was the Christian crowd. Um, there was a crowd of really talented musicians that were halfway in and halfway out of Christian music, like Tommy Sims and Charlie Peacock and Chris McHugh and, and stuff like that. And so we were all kind of like the weirdos um, working on all these records together and, and, uh, and having a lot of fun, um, you know, and um, I watched people do a lot of drugs, <laughs> um, which I'm sure you have also experienced. So did uh, it, did you ever, did it ever occur to you that maybe you wouldn't stay in Nashville? Cause it just seems like, well, Nashville done end of story. Yeah, you know, I don't 
process time in a linear fashion all that much. And I think what kind of happened is I just put my head down about being good at something. And when I poked my head back up, I had lived in Nashville a long time. And that was all of my contacts. Um, I didn't think going back to New York was really an option because New York's crazy expensive to live in. Yeah. And there's, there wasn't, I mean, there was, there was music going on there, but I don't know. And, and LA, I, I think maybe LA just intimidated me or, um, you know, I was, I was loath to, to walk out of a scene where I actually had work and was doing stuff and walk into something where I don't know anybody, you know, I didn't have any family out there. I didn't really have any connections out there. I did really strongly. And I still regret to this day, not doing this is consider going into film score mixing. Right. Um, because I really, really loved and got to, got to learn from Sean Murphy at Aspen. Mm -hmm. um, and his work's just incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, he's stunning. on the Mount Rushmore. Yeah. And his, and what was funny at Aspen is, is we would do things where we were listening and talking about records we liked. And we were like, dude, check out 10 Summoner's Tales, man. This record is, it sounds really good. And he's like, does it, you know, and <laughs> then he would proceed to explain to us why it didn't sound good. Um, and you're like, wow. Okay. You know what? I hadn't thought of that. Um, which is, it's still a record I like, but Sean was very insightful and had amazing years. So there was a part of me that is like, if I call him and say, can I come out and assist with you? I probably could have, but not assist. He liked to say, my assistants have 15 years of experience as firsts, which I get, right. but I probably could have worked my way into film scoring. And I still truly love working with orchestra stuff when I can. And uh, I regret that a little bit because I, I, I love that stuff. But you do get to do some. I do. I, I'm, I do. I, I, uh, I work with a guy who does stuff for Disney and, and uh, Disney like the mouse does not fuck around. So, you know, it's always London symphony orchestra at Abbey road studio one, you know, and it's yeah. just like, you know, and when they play like the star Wars theme, you're just like, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and do you get to go record that stuff or are you just mixing it? I don't, I, I don't, they usually, they usually just cut it with Simon or, or whoever's, whoever's yeah. over there. Um, uh, I would love to go over there. I was supposed to go last year because I finally was just like, look, when you're going, I'll just fly over because I want to sit in the room with the LSO um, and just experience it on the floor to see what it really sounds like. Like, boom, there, which is amazing. If 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 you, I mean, I'm sure you've done this, but uh, to get to sit in a room with a full orchestra and listen to them play, it's truly just humbling. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. especially in a room like Studio One there or the big room at Air, or, you know, any of the kind of purpose-built orchestral rooms, it's yeah. pretty spectacular. Yeah, should probably try and do it while they're still around. Yeah, well, you want to wait for them to be able to get back to capacity, though, because, of course, you can't put 60 players in a room now. You're down to 20, and they got to clear out. That is out. true. That is true, I, and I, 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 I found out a geek, a geek shit thing which I didn't sign an NDA, so I'm just going to say it. Um, the last thing that we did out of London, the string players were in one and the, and like the brass players were in two. And Abbey Road has sampled Studio One in their Sony sampling digital reverb. <laughs> and they print that. So and they printed I've, the brass through it from Studio Two. Yep. And I, uh, I, I guarantee you that that has not left that studio. And do they do that because Studio Two is such a terrible sounding room? <laughs> yeah i'm sure no i think they just kind of wanted to put it in the same pocket yeah yeah you know yeah with everybody um so yeah that was that was yeah and i i don't know if this is true or not but you hear stories about like people trying to sample the chambers at capitol and like the assistant catching them running tone like what the fuck are you doing and they pull it and you know take the files off the hard drive not doing it and now, thanks to UAD, we exactly. don't have to. Exactly. Also, as an aside, I love that Al Schmidt has one setting, and it's the default setting for that plugin. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. It's like, so here's the, the way it's supposed to be used, and here's a bunch of different other ways. Yeah, now you can do whatever cool. you want. Though, yeah. I have to say, just because I got to give him a shout out for this. The guy whose presets I actually have as my starting point on that plugin for everything is Daryl Thorpe. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he's, I mean, dude, Daryl is a, Daryl is a beast. Yes. Like he is his, he is his own. The man is an Island. Yeah. (laughs) A really nice Island. A really, really nice Island. Yeah. (laughs) A big one and it's fortified, but it's a really nice Island. (laughs) Yeah, it is. So anyway, we, we digress. Um, Yeah. Sorry. So no, why don't apologize. I mean, like we could just step through your career because then we'd we'd latch onto things, but I, there's no reason not to shoot off in different directions here. Because cool. okay, so like you say, you got your first mixing credit only about four years after you got your first assistant credit. Yes. So and that that was because someone was lazy and broke, right? So it was on a Christian hip hop record. This this group called Grits which as an aside has one of the most famous TikTok songs of all time. Really? Um, yeah. And, uh, and hopefully they're getting paid for it now. Cause I remember like two years ago, they were like, you know, we've gotten like billions of streams of this song and they haven't paid us a dime, you know? So hopefully that's rectified, but uh, these guys are super cool. It was East coast hip hop right up my alley. And they had uh, this amazing mix engineer who's still here in Nashville named John Yash. And they could hire him to mix like two or three of the singles, but the rest of the record, they didn't have the budget because Christian hip hop. Right. So um, the, the producer was like, well, I'll just mix it. And he called me. He's like, can you, I was assisting Yash. He's like, can you assist me? Cause I don't know how to run the studio. I don't know how to run the SSL. I don't know how to do all that stuff. And so I said, well, I'll make you a deal. Um, why don't you let me mix one song before you get here? Because if you come in and you like it, less work. If you come in and you hate it, you're going to have to do it anyway, right? So win-win. And he loved it, and the band loved it, and the label loved it. And the next thing I knew, I was mixing the rest of the record. And then the next thing I knew, I was mixing a fair amount of the records for that label, and then off we went. Wow. Yeah. So... uh, Luck, luck is preparation meeting opportunity, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's how I ended up doing a shit ton of CCM music. Right. Right. Which it's, as you described before, it's a very weird genre to be a part of because it's not a genre. It's all the genres. It is. It's really bizarre. It would jump all over the place. Um, and, uh, it was kind of fun to code switch like that. Right. Cause I loved all this different music. So it was great to be able to do something that was a little rock and something that was a little pop and something was hip hop and something was whatever. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that was fascinating. I love the people I was working with and, and, you know, unfortunately we weren't, this is where the move to LA would have been great. Cause I think the budgets would have had an extra zero or two. Um but that's okay. You learn to, you know, you learn to work lean and mean and, and uh, you have a lot of fun and it's like, you know, I get paid to listen to music. So how much complaining can you, well, bring? yeah. And your rent would have had an extra zero on it too. Oh so. yeah. There is that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, how long were you in LA? 25 years. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, my ass hurts just thinking of all the driving that you've done. Oh, I can't tell you how lovely it is not to drive places now yeah 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 i can imagine i can imagine it's i mean it's part of why i had a a studio at my house for the last 18 of those years so i just do as much as possible at home yeah because even a nearby studio was going to be half an hour yeah i i I remember when nashville people won't wouldn't drive like a half an hour in Nashville, like ever. I would work on records with people who lived in Franklin, which is like 22 miles south of here, and they wouldn't come because it's such a long drive. I thought that was hysterical, you know, because, yeah. you know, if you're going into New York, you're 90 minutes on the train or like whatever, like it's going to take you whatever, you yeah. know, and LA is even worse. But uh, now Nashville has really bad traffic, so it takes almost 30 minutes to go places. Almost 30? Good God. Almost How do you 30. cope? I don't I stay in my studio. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> now, your studio, just to digress a little bit, it's attached to a house, but it is not the house you live in. Is this do I have this right? Correct. Is, um yeah. uh 
a while ago when I finally got to do this, I had one in my own studio for forever. I was kind of, I figured out early on that I didn't want to move studios like engineers in Nashville would have racks and they would just move from studio to studio. And I hated that as a mix guy. Cause yeah. I felt like I was always guessing and it made me feel really insecure. Um, you know, I don't like guessing. So I started like just kind of locking myself into a certain studio. So I was at one place for five or six years and another place for five or six years and finally pulled the trigger on buying my own place. And I found a house that I liked and, uh, I, you know, I was like, well, if the music business goes to hell in a handbasket, at least it'll be a half acre in a nice part of town. Right. You know, so, uh, and maybe that'll, it still will be, I, I, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, I, I finally built my own studio, which was super scary and super awesome. And I wish I had done it 10 years earlier. And do you run other parts of the business out of the house or is someone living in the house? No one's living in the house. Um, uh, infrasonic mastering is on the other side of the wall. Oh, right. Um, okay. So Pete's actually and, uh, in the building. Yeah. So it's me and 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 an assistant usually and and whoever's in our kitchen eating stuff or whoever's in the lounge doing whatever. Hopefully and you know the, whoever's in the kitchen eating stuff. Actually, we don't really care. Like, I mean, if you're in town, feel free to just walk in the door and I have a coffee and sit down. All right. Anyone. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's generally open. That's really good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Come. Leave the fair child though. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fine, man. They're too heavy. You can't carry. Yeah, anything. they are. <laughs> so, all right, awesome. Um, I just, God, I don't even know. Like, we just do this. I mention records, and I'm forty something weeks in, and it gets boring to just say. And then you worked on this record, but there are so many records that I want to just see what you have to say about it. Because I mean, also, let's talk about just for a second the fact that I believe I've got this count right. You've got 10 Grammys. Is that right? Let's clarify. I have worked on 11 Grammy winning records. Okay. Due to crediting. And this, this is, I, this gets scrambled in every, every place that got, it gets printed. But if you walk into my bathroom on the back of the toilet, which is where they live usually, it are five Grammy statues. That is a very large toilet. It, it is. Well, there's only three. Actually, there's two now because two of them make a really great paper towel holder um, with the, when you face the horns at each other. Nice. Um, so I have five. I've done 11 Grammy award winning records. I have five you've Grammy statues. You personally statue. got five statues. Yes. yes. Very nice. Um, so that's that's the... I think that's the correct that's the correct count. All right. I well, think. I mean we can talk about all of those. I just feel like I want to skip around. Do you care if we skip, skip around? around? And cuz I and I want you to mention Never. things that you that you just want to talk about. But let's okay, so going slightly in order. Before we get to what as far as I can tell is one of your first um like multi credits where it seems as though you basically did everything except produce the record, but you worked on a Patty Griffin record. Yeah. I well, would love to talk like, about that. Dude, one of the not a Patty Griffin record, the Patty Griffin record. Well, yeah. Right? And uh, I mean, that was, I don't, I mean, so the great thing about Patty, other than she's just amazing, is that record got done in the basement of Jay Joyce's house in West Nashville, which he had kind of turned into a studio. Um, and he was really early, at least in Nashville, to the game of like, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Right. Um, they were just writing. Um, most of that record got done on Roland VS 880s. <laughs> right. Because that's what they were writing on. And the writing just sort of turned into a record. And I remember having to like transfer stuff from a VS 880 to a Studer two inch so that um, Brad or um, uh, Aaron off or whoever could cut drums on it, like in a real studio. Um, and those things don't sync, right? So once you do it, like, yeah, hey, that's you're it. done. You're done. Right? And 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 when you're doing demos, like people would just, well, we need an extra track on the 880, so let's just bounce these things down and then you're done, right? It's a four track, basically. Um, so being around for that record was amazing. Um, it's just, it's such a great record. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, she's a huge, huge talent. Just oh. crazy. She's just phenomenal. And, and Jay... 
uh, Jay Joyce is just, you know, an outside of the box genius, right? And he does so many things well. And, uh, you know, he's had a ton of success, which is great. But yeah, just working on that. Nobody knew anything about any anything. We were just kind of making it work. And it did. Big time. It did. Although I do remember, I think she was on A&M. And I remember them calling her manager or something. And they're being like, Cheryl Crow's record is coming out the same day as yours. And we're going to dedicate like 98.7% of our budget to that record. Oh, God. Well, because that was 98. So was that Globe Sessions? I'm not sure. Whatever. It was one of the big ones. Yeah. 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 So that was like that was kind of a bummer in retrospect because that the Patty Griffin record was genius, but it didn't get the push. Right. Well, you know, she's done all right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she gets by. Yeah. What you drinking there? Look. I am drinking tea. Is that a lime flu? Oh, it was just the cap. Oh no, no. It's just, yeah, no, it's just, it's, it's green tea and, uh, and, um, hibiscus. Wow. Um, yeah, it's fancy. That is fancy. You got your pinky up while you drink it, which is the correct way to do it too. There you go. See, Excellent. All right. I want to ask you. I want to ask you about this uh, a record, audio adrenaline. Oh yeah, audio A. Because you got um, this is this seems to be the first time when you're like super involved in every aspect of the record. You're playing stuff. You're doing all kinds of shit. Yes. So the guy who was the producer on that grits record. Um, it was a guy named Todd Collins and he became a really good friend of mine. And, and because we were young and we didn't know any better, we would just go in the studio and fuck around. So, you know, I, because I had assisted Rick and Rick had no compunctions about just doing shit to a record, give me a guitar, I'll play on it. Like we'll change this and blow this shit up and whatever sample this and fly it. Like we would just do whatever. So that's what I learned. You know, I was like, ah, fuck it. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? They're like, I hate that. It's like, cool, muted, done. Like, no big deal. So when we were doing the Audio A record, it was me and Todd in a studio that was also in a house down in Franklin. And the band would come in and out and then we would just screw around. So yeah, I was playing, I was doing turntables. I was doing programming. I would play piano. I would sing. Like we would do all this and we kind of just ended up kind of co-producing a bunch of stuff. And did you call your parents and thank them for the piano lessons when you played piano? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if any of the piano lessons stuck around. I can pretty much play in uh, I can play in C. <laughs> I think you know, if it took Microcosmos to knock you out of the lesson game, then I think you were past playing in C. Yeah, you know, none of it stuck with me though, man. I'm I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm uh I can sit down what I have the ability to do is sit down and freeform improvise to the piano in a way that your great aunt thinks I'm a great piano player, but anyone who's an actual musician is like, oh, he's just fucking mad. Now why why are you picking on my great aunt? Why would she think that? That's <laughs> my weird. great well, my great aunt is gone. Yeah. So I'd have know, to think about it. I don't think I have any great aunts left either. So and on that sad note. <laughs> yeah. <let's... laughs> Bummer. Um, all right, so that same year, you also worked on a Bleach record, which is pretty cool. Oh, those pretty, guys are pretty awesome. cool. Uh, yeah, man, those guys. Wow, I have memories of I have memories of doing that record. I have memories of doing so. Christian music never really had big budgets, so you had to get inventive, right? You had to figure stuff out. And I remember doing some overdubs in the producer's basement, where we basically just built a. Uh, booth out of like concrete and blankets and all of that stuff and i remember at one point there were people that would tend to run out of the vocal booth sans clothing on a fairly regular basis um but uh yeah i mean we worked on a ton of really fun like little indie records uh back then that were just kind of a blast and did you ever because while we said you know musically it isn't a genre it's very much a thing if you're working on contemporary christian music so did you ever worry about being pigeonholed or try to sort of actively make sure you were doing other stuff as well or you're making records who cares this is great yeah i mean i was naive about that like you're making records who cares um i i i didn't I never really thought about, is this going to be good for my career? I was just like, cool, we get to make records. Awesome. Right. Um, and uh, uh, 
so yeah, you definitely get pigeonholed. And in Nashville, also you get pigeonholed where where it's like, well, you know, when a group has some success and now they have some money, it's like now we can work with like a real engineer like from LA. Right. Right. That was definitely that thing. Um, like it was kind of always chasing. You felt that Nashville, the attitude of some of the bands and some of the label people were, you know, it's always the bridesmaid, never the bride sort of thing. And it's like, oh, cool. Now we can do a record with a real mix guy, you know? Um, and that's kind of a bummer, right? Like that's, you're like, wow. Okay. So I kind of busted my ass when you guys were nobody and had no money. And now that you do, you're like, all right, see ya. Thanks for, you know, thanks for all the fish. And, um, uh, you know, that was a, that was a drag, but that shit happens to everybody everywhere. Yeah. Right. It, so, it, absolutely. If you were doing stuff, cheaply in LA then they'd finally get some money and work with the people who charged money in LA I mean you know you were worth whatever yeah. you got paid basically right. but I would right. imagine I mean that's changed right it isn't like everyone thinks like you can't get stuff done in Nashville no I mean, no it's it's definitely changed I think it was more aspirational than anything else I mean if you grew up listening to Neil Avron records or uh, Avron Avron Avron. I was Avron. Avron he was another um, Miami guy when I was there that guy, yeah. fucking hell, man. That guy was born. Yeah. Everything he did sounded like a hit record. I know. So, it, I mean, his stuff, I thought his stuff was great. So, you know, when you have a band that just grows up on the stuff that he did, and they're like, we want to work with Neil Avron. I was like, yeah, me too. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, fucking A, hell yeah, go work with Neil. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's part of the process by which you start to learn uh, – and this is a very difficult thing and I still struggle with it not to take it personally. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's sucks and imposter syndrome sucks. And uh, you know, it's just kind of, it's part and parcel of the people that do this gig, I think. Um, and it took me a long time to learn that I shouldn't take it personally. And it took me even longer to learn that almost everybody has imposter syndrome. Yeah. You know, in the creative field, especially it's, it's been one of the best, not best, but it, one a really interesting part of doing these interviews is that almost every single person I've talked to has it. There are there are a few who don't, and like they don't even know what I'm talking about, which is amazing. Yeah, they're and they're, they're humble. They're not. It's not like they're egotists or anything. But but yeah. almost everybody has it, and I think part of it that's exacerbated with what we do is that we're not even working on our own art. It's our contribution to someone else's art. So we can't possibly know if we're doing a good job until someone tells us we are. There's right. no such thing as an empirically good job mixing a record. That's true. Yep. And that was really hard for me to accept. And and also I kind of, a friend of mine said this to me the other day. He's like, well, my bar of doing a good job is, am I the best in the world? And I was like, yeah, so that's unattainable. Right. And he was like, yeah. And that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cue yeah. the self-loathing. But, um, but it is what we're all trying to do. We would never want to say like, yeah, this was cool. But man, if you got that other guy to do, it would have been better. No, no. Um, although, I mean, I have sent records to other people who I thought would be better than me at doing them. Um, you know, because uh, sometimes it's just, look, I mean, dude, nobody's going to do what Vance does like Vance is is very fancy, and when a record needs something fancy, send it to Vance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Nobody else can Vance. No. So, um. All right. I want to hear about this Tommy Sims record because one of the tracks is on your playlist, and holy shit, does it sound great! Oh man. Tommy. And this was another Rick Will record, right? Yeah. So, I mean, again, we were this band of misfits. So Tommy is a freak of nature. Um, easily, I will defend this to anyone, easily one of the best bass players on earth. And I say that knowing about, you know, Pino and Tony and um, Abe and like, I mean, there's some monster bass players. This guy is right up there. He is the most effortlessly musical person I think I've ever met. Wow. Um, you know, he's a nightmare in like 16 other ways, but he's an incredible musician. Uh, and we were all kicking around. He ended up coming to Nashville to play in this 
Christian rock band called Whiteheart. And Whiteheart had him, Chris McHugh on drums, Gordon Kennedy. I, I mean, like all of these monster, monster guys who ended up being great session players, great writers, great producers, all of this stuff. But I, I think Tommy had probably been working on his solo record for 20 years under the radar, right? Um, and because I spent a lot of time around him doing all these other records, I ended up spending a lot of time around him doing that record. Um, so it was great. I mean, I got to track a lot of it. Um, I got to mix, you know, like four or five or six songs. I forget how many. Um, and I got to experience the, the, the Tommy Sims, which, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of Tommy stories. Um, Whoa. We used to put candles all over the studio. And one time he fell asleep and leaned back into a candle and it caught his hair on fire. And he woke up and said, dig, I'm on fire. <laughs> um, that tells you all kinds of him, stories. Man. Like Tommy, Tommy would, he would work for days on end without sleeping and then fall asleep for like all kinds. Of, I would walk into the studio in the morning and he'd be asleep on his keyboard and digital performer would be on like bar 250,000 and still running. And yeah. I mean, he was, he was an interesting guy, but uh, he, he was an incredible player. And I think he had that record in him uh, for a very long time. It was really fun bringing it out. I'm still of the opinion that somebody, like if anybody watching this is a really rich, crazy person, they need to take Tommy and Stevie Wonder and lock them in a studio with no MIDI for two years and just push food under the door. And what will come out is songs in the key of life, uh, you know, redux. Right. Well, let me ask you about this thing then. So he's been working on this record himself, sort of, kind of, for a really, really, really long time. Had he made the decision like, okay, I got to finish it? Or did you have to kind of push him to say like, well, no, now it is actually a record. Because sometimes those records never get done. I know some incredible musicians who play with other people and they, I, every like eight years, I hear a song that they've been doing and like, holy shit. And it never comes out. It's just never done. Well, I mean, I think you, you worked with a famous producer with a big beard who was kind of legendary for not finishing records, right? Until like, Labels would call and be like, we're going to sue you. And he's well, like, but okay. that was different. That was different. That was, you know, he had an end in sight. It's just who knew how long that was going to take to get there. But gotcha. but it, it was a process as opposed to it sounds like with Tommy's record, it was more like the working on it was as big a part of it as it being a finished record in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think he was doing it betwixt and between all the other stuff that he was doing. And um, I think it was something that he had carried around with him for a while. And I don't remember what the precipitating factor was. Knowing Tommy, somebody probably offered him a shitload of money to put it out. Right. So he's right. like, okay, I better finish it because if I don't finish it, then they're not going to pay the back half. Right. Right. That would be my guess. Right. Right. Uh, so there was an impetus to actually finish the record at that point. There had to have been, because you're right. He's a guy that would never finish anything, um, you know. But God knows how many how many amazing songs are in dats in a closet somewhere. Right. You know. So yeah, that was a crazy record. We did a lot of that on radar. Radar was a very big thing in Nashville. It was. It was. A lot of people really liked it. What'd you think yeah. of it? I thought it, I mean, I thought it sounded good. Uh, I thought it, it, the interface was a little kludgy, but coming from working on analog tape, I, I can see how that made sense, you know, to people. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was functional. It's funny to think back to days and they're dim, but when, you know, you didn't have the tool yeah. to, you know, to run around in. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, a, yeah, I didn't have any problems with radar except that I, you know, and I'm sure you share this with me, how much of our lives have been spent backing up archaic formats? Oh, endless. Absolutely yeah. I mean, endless. <laughs> yeah. So other than wrangling that, uh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. All right. Well, look, around the same time, there's a uh, a Parkway record. 
Oh, wow. Right? Glad you made it. Yeah. Now, that, as far as I can tell, is your first, like, production credit full-on production credit is that right or was there that is some stuff probably before? correct yes um uh i mean there's there was a, there was a lot of doing uncredited stuff i think mm-hmm. you know as we all do which is fine but yeah i think the parkway record was the first uh it may have been the first one that i did solo which was crazy i, rem- I remember having fun with those guys i feel like we did that record in sacramento Let's say it. Um, That's, you know. Yeah. Okay. Again, my, 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 I don't know whether it was just lots of Diet Coke. Uh, I just don't know if I'm built this way, but my, you know, my memory, my memory sucks. So I apologize if I'm fuzzy on the details, but yeah, Parkway. Cool. All right. Cool. Deep cut. There you go. <laughs> well, I'm just, because I'm, it's always interesting to get that first actual producer credit where like you've been hired as the producer. So really, I mean, I guess part of the question was, is did you get hired as the producer from the beginning as opposed to like getting credit where credit is due when you weren't even hired for it? But so being hired for that, that's a big deal, you know? Yeah. Yep. And uh, I remember that band, we went through a couple of iterations the one thing I do remember about that band is we were working in the studio and I don't know whether it was on their record or something else. And it was the same studio where we did audio a and they came in and they were like, guys, stop what you're doing and go to the movie theater and watch this movie called the matrix. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was those guys. And I remember me going, Keanu Reeves, who the fuck wants to go see that? So I've never seen the matrix in a movie theater, which is a bummer. Well, I've never seen it in the theater either. I don't think. I would like to see it in the theater because I'm sure it's amazing on the big screen. I bet it is. I'll tell you the one thing you got to see in a theater if you haven't is 2001. Yeah. I missed that when uh, when Nolan was like shop bringing that around to the IMAXs. Yeah, I got to I was doing an orchestral date up in Seattle or something, you know, one of those non-union go record strings on a record thing. And I thought I was going to have to spend the afternoon mixing them, but they really liked just the decatry that i'd set up like no you don't need to mix it like what around the corner cinerama dome 70 millimeter oh hell yes dude absolutely mind-blowing anybody who says they don't like that movie has only seen it on a television i i guarantee you yes i guarantee i i'm still stunned at this is going to lead to another conversation you can help me with this i'm still stunned at just uh, well everything but (laughs) just how much he nailed some of those visuals um, to the point of like, it's not even suspension of disbelief. You're like, how the hell did he shoot this in actual space? Yeah. Especially back then. Yeah. Um, So Kubrick, I've been on a, I've been on a quest to Uh try and find a word that encapsulates people like Kubrick. Right. Because there's, there's a level, right? There's a level that you hit. And, and for me, Kubrick's on that level. Um, John Williams is on that level. Chuck Jones uh, is on that level. Um, Bill Watterson, Calvin and Hobbes is on that level. Like I, I am, my life's hobby is finding the word that encapsulates that ineffable level of quality and mastery and brilliance and insight. And I don't know what that word is. And now you're about to say it. No, no, I'm not. I'm just, I'm thinking how eclectic that list is. You've obviously, you've thought about this before, but that is an amazing list of people. And I think, yeah. well, look, here, the problem is all the words that you would use are overused. They are geniuses. Yes. And it, it's like it's like the word unique, where people say, oh, it's kind of unique. Like, that's not a fucking thing. It's either unique or it isn't unique. <laughs> exact same. <laughs> you cannot, qual- qu- as soon as it's not 100% unique, it's no longer unique at all. And I think genius is the same thing. Oh, man, that thing's genius. And they're talking about, like, the new trucks on their skateboard or something. Like, that's yeah. not genius. That's some good engineering right. or whatever. But... Yeah, but I think there is also something transcendent where, like, I don't know that much about all those people as individuals, but, like, I know Kubrick is a fucking nut. I mean, an absolute nut. There's some documentary that I saw the first half of, and then it seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. And I think it was called 10,000 Boxes. And it was Hmm. about Kubrick 
Mark's research for Eyes Wide Shut. And one of the things was that he had, I feel like I talked about this last week, maybe. I don't know how this came up before. But anyway, he sent, it was either his son-in-law or someone like that, a member of the family, but who was working in his production company, around London to photograph doorways for the five-second scene oh, man. in Eyes Wide. And he had thousands tens of thousands of doorways that he looked at the pictures of and then narrowed that down to doorways that he went and looked at and then found the perfect one and that's every detail of every single movie he ever made exhausting like barry, barry linden have you seen barry linden oh yeah mm-hmm. one of the slowest moving movies in the entire world but just absolutely gorgeous but the beginning of every single scene whenever there is a new scene it is a painting, which then comes to life and the scene plays right. out. Every single scene. And it's lit that way. And it's, yeah. So, I mean, I I'm, genius doesn't feel like a strong enough word, but I think it, in its original context, that's the word. And also there's, there's, there's things to, it's, it's more, I love the word transcendent. That was fantastic. Like I, you know, it's transcending skill art genius um craft like you know there's a lot of there no there's not a lot but there is genius about that doesn't resonate like i use calvin and hobbs for an example there's a lot of great cartoonists right but that one is such an incredible blend of humor and pathos and and insight and like i mean like it's just incredible every time i read those i'm just like man this guy hit a lick yeah. like just a constant man amazing same with chuck jones i don't know how people i don't know how people timed animation like i don't know how he timed animation to make it act like that but it's real acting yeah you know uh and there's a, there were great other directors Fris Freeling was great and did amazing stuff and you know but none of it is Chuck Jones like you can just tell so who would you nominate for this list from the record industry either as an artist I mean you know I think Stevie Wonder is definitely one of your one of your heroes in that way but um do you is there a producer or an engineer that you would you would put up there I know that like there's Man. certain records like, you know, some of the Massenberg stuff, the Lyle Levitt record, there, there's certain things, but um, I'm cu- just curious. And this is no diss on anyone if there isn't anybody, but is there somebody? You know, that that's, I probably should have prepared that thinking. No, that no, but look, this. look, and let's, let's qualify this too. Kubrick had some clunkers, you know, not every single movie is 100% art all the way through. Right. So, right. you know. Like I would put Lenoir in sort of mid eighties to mid nineties there. Yeah. So there was a bracket of records that kind of all flowed into each other. And those were Peter Gabriel's So, Robbie Robertson's solo record. Yeah. And uh U2's Joshua Tree. And those records cross pollinated. In fact, I remember digging into the Clear Mountain mix on Robbie Robertson's record. And I think this is on the playlist. Yeah, and it is. It is Broken Arrow. I was, yeah, Broken Arrow. And I was listening to it. We were at MTSU and there was some guy in the class and he was like, this sucks. The fucking background vocals, they just, they're just trying to like copy Peter Gabriel. And I was like, no, it is Peter Gabriel, <laughs> idiot. Right. <laughs> so that, that when, whatever Lamois was channeling in that time was, I mean, it was frankly, it was just, yeah, it was transcendent, right? Yeah. I mean, Peter Gabriel's So record is is brilliant. And if anyone, if there's anyone musically who probably took pictures of 10,000 doorways, it was Peter Gabriel. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, he was, and probably because he was a little broken. Um, and that's what enabled him to do that. Uh, I just watched the documentary Free Solo last night and... The guy who climbed El Capitan without a rope. Oh, right. You know, the free climber. And uh, he was a little broken. You know, that's that's what allows you to hyper focus like that. You know, he was he was a little rock climbing autistic. Right. Um, so, sure. 
that's a great that's a great uh that's a great suggestion i think a lot of the stuff that quincy laid his hands on yeah um, would fall into there running the gamut from miles davis to to michael jackson um man from an engineering perspective andy wallace yeah um, did some incredible incredible stuff uh yeah massenberg massenberg's work on on joshua judges ruth this in particular um I love you know, hearing you talk about that record because you love it so much. Oh it's man, it just... was just the thing that I really love about it. I don't really care that it sounds good, although it does, but the immediacy of love it, right? Like you literally feel like he is in your face and you can hear, you know, everything. Like it's just so intimate and so immediate. That's the thing that I loved about that. Also, the uh, Matt Rawlings, the the piano that he plays on a couple of those songs, including the introduction to North Dakota, is just no one can play piano like that. I don't even know how to describe it. It's just this weird color, like this wandering, meandering color that's just really beautiful. I, I love Matt. He's amazing. Um, you know, I... I I'll think of three others as we keep. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we let's let's talk about you, then, because um, we we can talk about some CC Winans while we're at it. Ah, uh, CC, talk about a great singer. Um, oh yeah, it goes it goes without saying. Step back to the conversation we were just having is Freddie Mercury, right? Like, I don't think that guy didn't do much wrong as far as vocalists go. Um, uh. Yeah, Roy Thomas Baker. We can have a conversation on him too. Um, yeah, Cece. Uh, Cece's an incredible singer. You know, it was, she was one of the first people that I realized that, oh, you know how to get a great vocal sound? Put a mic in front of Cece Winans, <laughs> right? And don't distort it. Although I, I have yet to hear an Aretha Franklin vocal that isn't distorted from any time before like 1975. And I could give a shit. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, CC, CC was a great record. Um, it was so much fun. And, and again, you know, the best records are the ones where people aren't going into it nervous. They're going into it to just work, to make it as good as humanly possible right um like we just want to make it amazing and that was the case with the cc record uh uh which was a tommy record and um you know we just wanted to make it awesome and we worked really hard on it and it was awesome you know yeah. tommy's one of the guys tommy's one of the guys that would get sued to like finish a record like he just wouldn't stop the Kubrick thing he he heard something in his head and he wouldn't stop until he got it Right. And it doesn't matter how many like twists and turns you have to go through. Like, this is what we're going for. And it could be incredibly annoying, but it also forced everybody to up their game. So you always ended up getting great stuff. Right. So it's a win. So do you have any, cause you're starting to mix a lot at this point in your career that we're talking yeah. about. Who would, did you have mixing mentors or did you really just sort it out? I mean, obviously you're picking things up along the way. I'm not going to pretend like, you know, nobody invents it for themselves, but did you have people like, did you take a lot of stuff from assisting Rick, what he was mixing records or. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we co-mixed stuff and um, like we worked together really tightly and he taught me, he taught me a lesson that I should probably remind myself more often uh, to just be fearless about it. Right. To just fucking go for it. That it was at the end of the day, mixing is about emotion. It's really not about things sounding good. Um, Cause we all have favorite records that sound like shit, but uh, you know, they feel good. Um, so he was really into things feeling good. Um, and so he taught me to, to do the thing, which I think the, the Lord Algies also figured out is just turn the knob all the way to the right. And if it sounds good, awesome. You know, I think a lot of people were, a lot of people were like, man, I don't know. Is that too much compression? I did a record one time where the manager came in and looked at all the meters. And he was like, I don't know. Is that too much compression? 
So I'm just and so the next day when he here. came in, I had all the meters covered with tape, and it just <laughs> said, "Use your fucking ears," you know. Uh, yeah, like that's you know that's so Rick, yeah. Rick taught me a lot about being fearless and diving in and and going for it. And then you know, I mean, I got to assist. I got to assist for a bunch of people in Nashville because I was the best independent assistant in Nashville. I think I, I had earned that title by working my ass off. Right. So I got to learn from a bunch of people and that was really cool. Nice. So you want to talk about anyone in particular? Man, you know, I mean, it was like John Yash, uh, the guy who did that hip hop record. Like I did a bunch of assisting for him and I learned, I learned a ton from him about, um, trying to get clarity in the low end and, you know, trying to spread things wide. I've always kind of had an obsession about getting stuff outside of speakers. Like I want to feel like I'm in it, you know, and in the music instead of looking at it. Um, so he, he was the guy who had like the Hughes spatializer, like screwed to a rack shelf and he would be using that to move like vocals outside of the speakers and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, there was a guy named Tom Lonnie who was very, uh, who's very particular. And we would mix at October on the, on an E and like, he would have me reset the console in between every song. Um, and that actually taught me what not to do because I would, we would finish a song and I would pull up a new song on the tape machine and press play and it would play some crazy shit. Cause like it wasn't, you know, the tracks were everywhere and you would discover the coolest stuff doing that. And I always thought it was ridiculous that you would, zero out the board because it's like well dude if those guitars sound awesome or that keyboard's going through this crazy reverb and it makes something you could use for the intro why not use it right? yeah that that's a vance thing he, i mean he says he does that for every mix and oh you know. yeah you never some of the i've i've had stuff that i've done on records that people were like dude that thing was so cool i was like total mistake <laughs> like absolutely unplanned <laughs> yeah you know the, the only thing that I did was I heard something weird and I was like, Ooh, let's use that. Right. That, you know, that's, that's it. So, you know, but Tom taught me a lot about um, approaching things with care and he would do stuff like when he cut drums, he would take a shotgun mic and put it like 20 feet in the air and point at the snare drum. And that was really kind of a cool thing, you know? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I assisted for guys like, Thoner, who was who's a badass and i got to watch all that shit go on and you know we did records with t-bone and uh um you know and that was a whole different style of doing stuff and um yeah i mean there was a lot of great talent in in nashville you want um, to talk about the t-bone stuff a little bit because it is really different he's like i don't know he's his own thing he is um you know, the one that I remember the most is there's this guy named Daniel Tashin. And most people know Daniel because he was one of the co-producers on Casey Musgrave's record that won the Grammy for record of the year. Right. Um, recently, Daniel and my friend Ian. Um, and when Daniel was doing that record, it was like some big major label record sort of deal. He was the young kid. He was the hot shot. He was literally going to be like the next big thing. Um and he had a lot of attitude about that. Like he knew he was going to be like the next big rock star, which we relentlessly mocked um, because that it's just, I yeah. don't know, Nashville. You don't, you don't say the, that shit out loud, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, you're inviting it. Right. And it's also like, I don't know, the, the Nashville crew or the weirdos that I hung out with, everyone was like, you know, no one had attitude. You just were there to work, right? Like, let's just work really hard. And so when he would come in with attitude, you know, we would do things like, I think we had a mannequin set up in the corner of the room and we just, I put tape on the forehead that says Daniel's opinion on it or, you know, whatever. And when he would say something like whatever, we would just point to the corner of the room, like, oh, there's Daniel's opinion. Um, so I just, I don't, I mean, I don't, I remember T-Bone being super chill and smoking prodigious amounts of, you know, jazz cabbage and, uh, <laughs> and cabbage. electric lettuce, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I mean, just the pleasure, one of the pleasures of our job, and I would, I almost said Nashville, but I know you've experienced this too, is being able to sit there and watch 
and listen to amazing musicians do amazing stuff. And the thing that T-Bone I think is good at, um, or at least he was on this record, was not getting in the way of amazing musicians doing amazing stuff. Yeah. You know, just putting the right crew in a room and letting them go. And was Mike Prasante um, engineering or was this with uh, Thoner? Um, you know what? It may have been Thoner. It may have been me and Rick. Right. Um, doing some stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. We did that in October, which was a studio that I helped build, which, by the way, um, to you whippersnappers out there, if you get the opportunity to build a studio, like, like get on your hands and knees and actually solder shit and build it, best way ever to figure out how everything works. Like, you know, genius. Also, back in the day when I was an assistant, it was job security because I was the only person who knew how that whole room was wired. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't label anything. Just right. Nothing. I just, keep, I just know. Got it all um, up here. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, I remember that just being really great players and it was the same crew, man. The, the crew that was on KT's record um, was also the crew that was on Tashin's record was also the crew that was on Tommy's record. Um, that was on some of these CCM records. We called it the one world crew. Um, same crew that did that crazy Garth Brooks record where, he almost did a record as somebody else. The Chris Gaines you know? thing. Yeah, yeah. At the last minute kind of kind of bailed on it. And we were all like, dude, you should have just gone for it, man. Cause it was good. Like the music was good. Well, I mean, it um, came out. It came out, but I I I, I seem to remember, and I may be completely remember misremembering this, but the, the idea was that he was just gonna release it and nobody was gonna know it was Garth. Right. I think and somebody I, got nervous. That, I think it got out like, that it was him. Maybe. I, yeah. I had a great, I think I've, it's weird. These conversations keep coming up and I don't know if I've had them on camera or not. But I had a conversation with, I was making some records with Don Was around that time. And Don had been working with Garth. And then Don had done a little bit of work or at least was talking to Garth about this record. And he said, look, the only thing you've got to keep in mind is your fan base is so big that if you alienate all of them, there aren't enough people on the planet left to make up the numbers you just lost. Like, you need to know <laughs> this is a niche thing. This is not a bring your crowd to a new thing. You yeah. Know? Which, it was for fun. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So most of those songs were Tommy Sims songs. Um, there were probably some that were on his record or on adjoining records. All right. Uh, and... Uh, you know, and when I say Tommy, I mean Tommy and Wayne Kirkpatrick and Gordon Kennedy and all those guys who ended up, those were the guys that ended up writing Change the World for Clapton. Um, and, uh, you know, we were all hoping that Brooks was just going to go drop that record and not mention it to anyone. And people were going to be like, who is this guy? Right. Because the record was really cool. And then yeah. it kind of all fell apart. Yeah, real but, Beatles uh, and Yeah. Yeah. It's totally cool. So. Yeah, that's what I remember about that. That and that was all mishmashed into the same era. That was kind of the the crew, right? You know? So, right. and by the way, that all started because Rick, as a kid from Ohio, came down from Ohio with Emma Grandillo and Jay Joyce and um, probably Doug Lancio, and they all just kind of started doing demos. And Jay and Emma had a band called In Pursuit that had like some hit back in the day. And you know, I mean, it's just this just this crazy cavalcade of talented people back when, you know, people would spend stupid money on records. Right. Right. All right. Well, this brings us, I mean, we're skipping things too, which you can come back to if you want to, but this, this brings us basically up to the Indy RE record. The first with her. Yeah. So yes. we've got to talk about that. Now th that you yeah. have a statue for that one, right? Is that one of the yeah, statues? Yeah, I have a statue for CC and, and, uh, and for India. Okay. Um, yeah, India, India is a really interesting person because she wasn't really a musician. She was a poet that Reen Nolly found in a coffee shop, I think in Atlanta and said, Hey, you should try writing songs. And she was like, Oh, well, maybe I'll try that. And she's just a naturally gifted, amazing singer who sees the world in a really weird way, um, which can be a little difficult in the studio when she's like, I just, I feel like we need a little more purple. Right. Yeah. That's a mixed quote. Um, so 
and she would do things like she would be on tour and she'd want to record her vocal when the inspiration struck. So we put her together a package of like an Avalon 737 and whatever mic it was, a Neumann or whatever. But on days when she was feeling down, she would just crank the 10K all the way up because it was it made her feel happier, like brighter. And then on other days, she would turn it all the way down. And there's one song on that record. It may have even been Good Morning, which sucked because there was no place to hide. But I spent like three days <laughs> matching because she had comped the vocal together from vocal takes, some of which had 15 dB of 10K <laughs> and some of which had negative 15 dB of 10K. So... And there weren't really plugins that could help you match it, right? So I was literally had it broken out on an SSL 9000, like matching syllables and moving it around until I could comp it back into like a workable vocal. That makes yeah, me feel little. weak just thinking about it. That's oh my gosh. horrible. You know, and, but I mean, and that, I guess that was also a time when I wasn't sitting there going, I am not fucking doing this shit. You know, like it was like, yeah, we can do this. Let's go. Let's figure yeah. it out. Yeah, that was crazy. So, I mean, she was, we did that record. I did that record with Drew and Shannon, um, which were a production team of Grammy Award winning songwriters and amazing players and amazing singers. And we did a bunch of records together, um, uh, like Mark Broussard and Johnny Lang and uh, Eric Benet and all this stuff. But India, India was kind of a special thing. Everybody really dug in deep and we, uh, we really worked hard on it. And the, the, the one funny thing about India was I was sitting at soundstage mixing and I took a lunch break and I went to tower and I bought like I bought the record I was mixing on CD. And then I went back to the studio and kept mixing the record. So what had happened, <laughs> would was, you like to explain that please? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess what it, she, I mean, she would not stop. Right. Like I remember she came in and listened to a mix one time and she's like, no, 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 this sucks. This sucks. This sucks. I hate this lyric. And of course I was over in the corner having like a cardiac arrhythmia. Yeah. Right. Um, and she was just like, Nope, I got to rewrite the lyric. So there were actually songs on that record where the second pressing of the CD has different songs. I mean, different lyrics, different mixes than the first pressing because they had to meet a ship date. So they just took whatever they had and put that out on the first pressing and they let her correct more of it later. <laughs> <laughs> and she, you know, she was kind of Kubrick about it. She was like, she didn't give a shit about deadlines, about right. budgets, about anything. It's just, she was going for her vision. Everyone else could just like get out of the way. And when they were like, well, we got to put this out. She's like, yeah, whatever. And I'm just going to keep going. So. And did, did she finish it as far as she was concerned? Like is the second pressing, like it's done or did she finally, was it one of those that got abandoned? I think, well, I mean, all great art is never finished. It's exactly. nearly abandoned, right? That's the famous quote. Um, I assume at some point she either finished it or lost interest because at some point we stopped working on it. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there were also times when you didn't know whether you were mixing or not because I was probably mixing it and three other guys were mixing it. and You never knew who was going to end up on the record or who wasn't. Um, you know, sometimes there was stuff that were there. There is stuff on records that has somebody else's name on it that I mixed. I know this for a fact. Um and I'm sure that it happened the other way around. Like, you know, how do you, you, know, you can't control it. But. Yeah. But so, all right. So with CC and then India, does this begin the era of you being able to mix the stuff you're working on? Or was it still things are getting taken away from you and sent to the person in LA or the whatever? Like, Yeah, I don't know. You know, the there was, there was this R&B. I was like the guy who mixed R&B in Nashville. Right. Um, and that was cool for a minute, although it led me to do it led me to do some records where I, I had we had bought this house in what was then kind of a cruddy area. And it had this huge building behind it, like a twenty four hundred square foot album. And I was. I, right. This is going to be awesome. And 
then I got into all these R&B records and some some hip hop stuff again. And uh, we were staying at the studio till four in the morning and all kinds of crazy people were coming in and out of there. And I was like, you know, I don't know. I had I had like newborns, right? I had a new daughter and I was like, I don't know if I want these people coming to my house at four in the morning. Right. And I don't know that I want them knowing that they are next week. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Like I kind of wanted to be your done internet. Your internet messed home. up right at the right at the punchline there. Oh no! Um, so you didn't want to come to the house at four, and you didn't want them something. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, I didn't. I want. I didn't want them banging on my front door at four in the morning. Like, hey, I got an idea for this like song. Right. You know, like I want to tweak this mix. I was like, I kind of want to remain anonymous so i made the decision which turned out to be kind of stupid to not build the studio at my house um which had i done that much earlier i probably would have been much happier um with myself afterwards but you know uh woulda coulda shoulda what are you gonna do things have worked out it's kind of you know it's all right all right so look fast forward a couple of years 2005 you got some really odd credits i gotta ask you about so really? well, two thousand three. Okay, we got eighteens. Oh yeah, <laughs> the Diz, Backstreet Boys. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's all we need to say about that. Cliff no, it, you know that was that was again that was kind of an offshoot of CCM, and then all of a sudden I became sort of like the pop mix guy, um, uh, and it's because of some of the records and some of the people that had worked on those records, the CCM records, they knew me. And so they had pop stuff to do. And then I found myself in the studio doing pop stuff, um, which I like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a closet or not so closeted pop head. Like I, I will, I will get down to go West's King of wishful thinking, like for real, for real. Um, <laughs> uh, and I love the, that was, that was, um, that was Peter Wolf, I think, producing um, and doing all kinds of crazy. Same guy who did uh, We Built This City by Starship and uh, like really, really great, intricate call and response pop stuff. You know, he was kind of like um, Mutt Lang if Mutt Lang were super into synthesizers like himself, you know, and he would do all this crazy programming. And I think that was all TLA. Um, uh, just crushing it, you know, like so I, I'm a huge pop head, dude. I'm I, I know every, probably every piece of Richard Marks records and Peter Satira records in Chicago and like all of that stuff. I, I love all that stuff. So yeah, it was super fun to mix pop records. Right. Um, so, uh, and that, uh, that was actually a relationship that with the 18s and jump five and all of that, that turned into the projects that I do now once or twice a year that are these big Disney projects because the guy that used to produce that stuff does like these big Disney projects for like the parks and, and stuff like that. Right. Um, Which is a fascinating left turn, but a really fun, a really fun out of the box experience. It's actually in the box. It's in the box, but well, let's talk about those because you brought them up. So let's hear about those projects. Well, you know, Disney doesn't do stuff by half. So like the one that I'm I'm actually about to finish uh, right now is if you go to Disney World and you go to Epcot Center, there is a huge production that happens in the, the lake that, where all the countries around the world are there. And there's a song that has been playing or a, a show that has been playing there for over 20 years and they're replacing it. And that's what we're working on. Wow. So no pressure. This, yeah, no pressure. Like, I mean, and make no mistake, Disney, Disney has fanboys, right? Like, and they are hardcore. Like, there are people who are deconstructing every show, everything on the internet. Like, it's it's you know it's yeah. it's you know there's the recording people and there's like, uh, you know, people who dress up like Furbies and and then there's Disney people like you know to each his own. Um, but this show is, it's only like 40 minutes music, but they literally recorded it everywhere on earth. There is percussion from Africa and Israel and 
you know, like, I mean, it's, they went all over the planet recording all of this stuff. And most of the songs are 500 tracks or more. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting challenge to shove 500 tracks of stuff out of two speakers. Yeah. And yeah. so you're mixing stereo. I mean, you yes. deliver stems like crazy, but I'd imagine the playback on this, is it a multi-speaker playback or is it where there's basically a stereo mix that you can hear no matter where you're standing kind of thing? Um, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, this is actually one of the things where you have to check mono compatibility. Right. Um, because depending on where you are in the park and depending on what the system is designed for, like it, it, it can move in and out of stereo. But I think in general, it's stereo. Right. Um, but you're right. It's 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 stereo stems like it gets delivered in like 48 stereo stems and they'll probably come back to me afterwards and ask for more breakouts, depending on what syncs to what music, you know, what syncs to what lighting and what, you know, it's it's incredibly complicated. They've been working on this project for over two years. Right. Wild. Man. Yeah. But it's a really cool challenge and it's a really great it's really fun to like completely shift away from, Hey, let's mix this for country radio to let's do this like crazy Disney thing that never ends. Yeah. That will, <laughs> that will play for the next 20 years. It will play for, it will play for 20 years. There will, there will be a lot of people who have like formative memories with this stuff. Just like I'm sure I did when I was a little kid and we got to go to Disney world and yeah. hopefully, you know, all of this will boil down to the fact that I'm going to find a way to get VIP access to Star Wars uh, <laughs> land. <laughs> uh, it's probably not going to happen, you know. Uh, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can do. Work it. Work it. Yeah. All right. Look, man, there is a Cliff Richard credit in 2005. Oh, yeah. What the Wild. hell is that? Well, so. The King of apparently, Wales. Apparently, he's like a big deal. Huge. Um, Huge. Look, here's yeah. here's how big a, a big a deal he is in the UK. Is that you know the show The Young Ones? Mm -hmm. Okay, not that big in the states, but big. I mean, Motorhead played live on The Young Ones. Like that's how cool a show that was. The final joke of the final episode is basically Cliff Richard. Like <laughs> he is a cultural icon over here. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember. I actually said to him in the studio, you are the most chill, super famous person I think I've ever met. And he loved being in Nashville because he was like, I can go to Barnes and Noble and get a coffee and sit down with a book and no one says anything. Yeah. You know, and apparently if he walks down the street in London, people will start to like, follow the guy um super super nice guy um really kind really generous really humble like I, we had a blast working with uh sir cliff and he had like the best stories things that stories that ended with lines like so i just said give me that fucking guitar john and you know lennon and i'll show you how to tune it right <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I think his guitar wasn't, didn't his guitar player in the shadows basically help develop the Vox amplifier? I have no idea, but that sounds like a really good story. So let's say yes. Right. Yeah. Let's say yes. Like, I mean, he would tell us stuff like that. And, and it's just, it's just hysterical because you're like, this is a guy that the Beatles looked up to, you know? Yeah. Like, it was a contemporary. Like, that's, that's just wild. Yeah. I mean, so, Alan Parsons last week was talking about the shadows and they were people haven't even really heard of him outside of the UK. Think of him as Cliff's backup band, but they were a serious, serious influence. Major. Yeah, yeah they they totally were. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's it's like you knew he was like he was in the studio after he had come back from vacation on some island near Capri with Tony Blair. Right. Like literally or some shit like that. Um, but when he was in the studio, you know, and this is something that I've seen repeated. He was all about doing a great job and working really hard and being incredibly gracious and appreciative to everyone who was working on the project. 
Um, and, and, you know, you start to really appreciate that. That was, that was great. Michael McDonald is exactly the same way. I mean, if anybody could have attitude, it'd be Mike Mack. And he is, we used to, we called him the grandfather of benevolent cool. Like he is just the most <laughs> chill, nice guy. I, I'm at one point he was like, man, I really want to thank you for, you know, working so hard on my record. I was like, you're Michael fucking McDonald, <laughs> dude. Like, come on. But he's a sweetheart, you know, and and uh, I love seeing that because we all have stories of like the attitude and the assholes and the blow and all of that stuff. And it's really nice to to get around people who have had great success and you realize, oh, they had that because they're humble and they work hard. Yeah. And you know? I think I mean, my experience is most of the truly successful people I've worked with are like that. Yeah, me too. It's the ones who think they ought to be more successful who are the problem. And now we're back to imposter syndrome. Yeah, well, yeah, but that's imposter <laughs> syndrome and being an asshole. So that's different. Right. Well, I mean, I think I think it's a I think it's a con it's compensation. You yeah. feel insecure and some people fold inward and some people just push outward. And um, other but people it's still just a basic war on, insecurity. On Britain. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Napoleon thing, mm. you know. Yes. Absolutely. Totally. Little prick. <laughs> I don't know how I got there. Sorry. Um, well, I'm I'm very glad to have heard because sometimes a credit like like the Cliff Richard thing would come up and I'd ask about it and they're like, "What? No, I didn't work on anything with Cliff." So I'm glad that that was actually a thing. That's great. Yeah, I had no idea. By the way, like I had to go look Cliff Richard up, and then I was like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah." Well, but exactly outside, and that's one of the things. It's funny because there's there's a tradition of English artists going over to the States to work with things like going to Muscle Shoals or whatever to make records and nobody has any idea who they are. Like Robert Palmer did it three or four times, you know, came over to work with different bands, Little Feet and all that. And it's just, it's a thing, you know, the love of American roots music is very, very strong in the pop culture here. And when you're successful it's one of the first things you do is go off to the states and record with these people so and yeah, obviously cliff who, was, I mean, was who, in who but, wouldn't want to go to muscle shoals and and like seriously what the hell was in the water there like where where did these you know hasty like honkies come up with this funk like how did how did that happen i have i have no idea yeah <laughs> It's pretty incredible. It is pretty, pretty incredible. I had actually, uh, and I think I may have taken it off. I, I don't remember if I left it on the playlist because I w really was trying to get it down to 11 because um, that's a funny inside joke too, right? So uh, Very funny. But, but I, I had uh, Aretha Franklin's cover of, is it on there? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Eleanor Rigby? Yeah. And it, I mean, it's like, it's three channels. You know, left, center, right, which is how everything should be panned anyway. But the uh, the playing is just. I, yeah. Yeah. It's nothing to insane. say. But also, how great is it to have a song that's double string quartet, but everybody knows it inside out and have it translated onto traditional instrumentation? Yeah. It's kind of weird in a way because people don't cover that song a whole lot. Probably no, it's because it's, one of, it's weird like that, but it's awesome. It's so it's good. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. And in fact, that's that's uh, back to geek shit. Like when somebody says, hey, what does a U48 sound like? I say, it sounds like Eleanor Rigby. Specifically <laughs> the one on the 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 Yellow Submarine um, r release. The soundtrack. Uh, yeah, yeah, where it's just, the vocal is just, it's spectacular. And I don't think they had auto-tune. I'm not sure. Oh, man, I'm sure they did. They must have done. You <laughs> they know. must have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah. Look, I mean, you know, it's ridiculous to say anybody doesn't appreciate how amazing they were, but you can constantly reappreciate it. That three, four-part harmonies being sung live three part to be fair i love ringa but he wasn't singing during those but the other three guys three part harmony all sung onto a single track yeah done no it's amazing and I, as a little kid i didn't get it like i i wasn't into the beatles because the beatles when 
the Beatles that I got introduced to other than magical mystery tour, which was kind of trippy, you know, and as I speak this, I think I'm thinking I did have a bias toward records that didn't sound good. And some of that early Beatles stuff was kind of screechy, you know, like the, the one, two, three, like knock the, knock the record out thing. Yeah. I had never thought about that. So I guess I did have a predilection for stuff that quote unquote sounded good. But I would imagine from the way you describe your your parents' music glistening things, like they would have had the first two or three records. They were not going to be running, you know, I mean, Rubber Soul maybe, but Revolver was not going to be in heavy rotation. No. no. In fact, I, I think the only one they had was Magical Mystery Tour, which was a really weird choice. Probably could, well, maybe th that. that's a, you know, think about like, okay. The only Black Sabbath record I owned forever was Technical Ecstasy, which has got to be the worst Black Sabbath record ever made. <laughs> but that's the reason I only had one. Because someone's like, Sabbath, man, you got to get some Sabbath. Like, all right, cool. This one's out now. I'll get that. And it was, I mean, it's horrible. But that's hysterical. so you get stuck with it. So your parents probably, all their friends, peer pressure, get some Beatles. Come on, come on, come on. Get that one. They're not digging. Yeah, it. I don't know. That may have just come inside the case that they bought to carry the rest of their music. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I like my story better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's crazy. So, um, yeah, where were we? Um, I don't. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about Flyleaf of all things. Oh yeah, you know, and and that was because that's a very cool sounding record. It was a super cool sounding record and they were a super cool band. And I have to, I don't remember how I ended up mixing that. I feel like I did a couple of songs and maybe it was something where somebody had heard um, a, a rock record that I had done. Yeah, I don't, I, I honestly don't remember. Because um, I know CLA did some mixing on that. So I would imagine this is another one of those they could only afford a couple of songs or something like that. I would think so. Um, you know, that song ended up being a single, so that's great. But mm. but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I CLA, TLA um, were the, the bar for that type of music or for a couple of types of music. And, you know, I mean, I think their work is is really brilliant. In fact, a, a song that I wish now that I had put on the playlist was there was a local guy named Owsley. His name was Will Owsley. And um He's gone now too, unfortunately, but uh, he did his own records and I, we loaded a tape machine into a, a, an old house and I built a studio and we recorded that shit. And like, he was a, he was all about TLA, right? So he had to go down to Miami and mix it with, with Tom. And uh, he was a fanboy, man, like fanboy. And I remember he was talking about going down there and mixing a song with him. And he came in and he, you know, Tom hit play, listened to the song. And Will was like, oh, man, that's that's fucking amazing. I, you know, it's perfect. It's all right. I mean, the song's done. Let's do that in a vocal up and, you know, and we're good. And Tom with the cigar, you know, in the studio, he's like, the vocal's plenty loud there. Fuck face. Puts the cigar back in. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. I've never really gotten to spend a lot of time with those guys, um, but um, man, they're they're heroes of mine in my book. I know but, people love to hate on them on the internet. And, look, you know, yeah, I mean, whatever. I look. Two things I want to say. One thing is that obviously TLA and CLA get all the love, but I do want to mention JLA because Jeff Lord Algae, and we were talking about this before we we went on air. I just wanted to yeah. say that because it makes us sound like we're doing something really special. Sexy. Um, is there is a Steve Winwood record, uh, Back to the High Life, which has all three of them on it. And Jeff was an assistant at that point. So there were three Lord Algae brothers. And that really made me and everybody my age very frightened. There was no fucking way there could be three of them. And so we we're kind of no. happy that Jeff did not continue making records the way TNC did. Cause... No offense, Jeff. I'm sure you're a very lovely human. No, absolutely yeah. amazing. No, I'm saying like if those three were going, there would be no records left for anybody else on the planet. No, and then they would start cloning, you know, algaes. Yeah. Or lords or whatever the hell their actual last name is. 
Um, and cause I'm, I got, I got news for you. Nobody from New Jersey is named Lord Algae. Um, well, anyway, <laughs> <We're> gonna... <laughs> but, but I will boys, say, right? I will say I've gotten to spend some time with them and they're, like I had a, a car ride with them during AES a couple of years ago in New York and my wife was in the car and Al Schmidt was in the car and it is one of the funniest kind of 25 minutes I've ever had in my life. That's I'm awesome. not going to expand upon it, but it was amazing. Like so surreal and funny that it it has endeared them to me for life. They are just <laughs> great, really great. Well, I got nothing but Jersey love for for those guys, and and man, what a what a ton of great work that they've done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they defined that for everybody for years and years and years, and still do. Still do. Yeah. You want to mix yeah. a, a radio ready rock record. That's how you do it. That being said, the the Winwood stuff wasn't really. It was a different thing. And yeah. it's brilliant. Um yeah. and I also want to say that Ted Jensen told me that was a record that they cut as a direct metal master. Really? Which apparently is a horrifying process fraught with issues and only works on certain types of music and he he did not make a he, he didn't make a very happy face when he was talking about that but he says that if you get the uh there's a certain like a first pressing release of that on vinyl that it's absolutely free. like he was like that one was one that we were really proud of the way it came out right and i think that was relatively early on i mean obviously both LAs had been working, you know, they hadn't just started, but it was relatively early on. And yeah. I mean, Russ Tideman as a producer and obviously Steve Winwood as a producer, I mean, he just made the f two records before that himself. So yeah, yeah, there was a lot. And that was New York. I mean, that was when they were in New York. Like that was a full yeah. on New York record, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And getting Stevie to go there to do it, I'm sure was something considering he made the okay. last two at his house. You know, I can only imagine. But anyway, we digress, because we're here to talk about you. <sighs> it's trying. <laughs> it's it's going well, I think. It's it's yeah. going well. So, um, I mean, there's still just so many fucking Grammys to talk about. But, I mean, uh, well, let's talk about the Johnny Lang record. Yes, let's talk about that record, because I love that record. So, there... There is always something good to find in any record you work on because somebody's poured their heart and soul into something. And even if I'm just going to listen to it for a couple of days, you know, they're going to listen to it forever. But the Johnny Lang record I distinctly remember was another Drew and Shannon record. That was a record where everything was just working, right? Like I would get the songs, I'd start mixing around. 10 o'clock by one o'clock i'd be happy with it they would come in by three o'clock everyone was happy we're done like it never felt like work it just felt like everybody trying to work to the top of their game it was so much fun i adored making that record it's amazing when it, it can be that effortless in a way i mean obviously you're working hard but it oh, just yeah. everything you, you do and you works. want to like you, I, I would disembowel myself for those records just because there's no one's, no one's uptight about anything other than, is this as good as we can make it? And I actually learned something on that record. Drew Ramsey would come in um, and he was the guitar player uh, and he would come in and we would sit there and see how much guitar we could remove. Like, Let's see how much we can take out before we really start to miss it. Yeah. You know, which was kind of the opposite from what a lot of people yeah. end up doing. Right. And I thought that was kind of interesting. We did the same thing on India. Um, you know, like what can we lose? What can we, I mean, you know, that what's the quote, like perfection is achieved. Not when no, nothing can no longer, you can no longer add anything, but when you can no longer take anything away, you know, um, that was kind of interesting. That was an interesting way to look at it. I also remember on the Johnny Lang record, the the I was on I was using Pro X and I had 
probably 30 blown pro act drivers lining like the walls of the racks of the studio the racks were made of metal so the magnets would stick so i just had <laughs> blown pro acts so it was a big room and shannon liked to crank it and we would just blow the pro act woofers <laughs> constantly so it's a good thing the mixes are going quick because you're spending a lot of time soldering because those had to oh, be soldered dude, in yeah, so much so much yes they are <laughs> soldered in and getting yeah, a soldering I, iron to not stick to the magnet is difficult I think at some point we just had like the tech shop or an intern or somebody like put banana spade connectors on it. Cause right. we were like, look, we know we're replacing these. So let's just prep 20 of them. <laughs> Man, that's great. Well, so that record did okay for you there. Yeah, no, that was, that was great. That was another, that was a really gratifying Grammy award winning uh, record. Cause I mean, Johnny was such a nice guy and such a talent. And yeah, it was just great to see that happen for everybody on that record. And another Grammy-winning record that year, the third day record, wherever you are. Yes. Yeah. Um, and those guys, again, super great guys. They've been a band for a really long time. They went into the studio with a guy who wasn't super well-known at that point, a guy named Paul Moak, um, uh, who has a really great studio here. And, you know, they just hammered out a really awesome record. Um, and I remember having a lot of fun doing that record. And I actually still have a sample in my sample library called 3D Gank Snare. And I think it was <laughs> like a snare drum from that record I had put out through a guitar amp and then sampled. And it's just this <laughs> like obnoxious <laughs> like noise that's really fun to sneak into stuff. Gank nice so, yeah the gank so and again those guys like um uh really fun guys really humble uh dude's a great singer he has a really unique tone like really no unique. instantly yeah yeah unique he has a unique <laughs> tone that's right no modifiers right yeah we're all gonna watch the hemingway documentary and realize that you don't need adjectives if you pick your words correctly yeah 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 and if you want to pick up the pace just say and 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 a lot <laughs> yeah a lot um uh so yeah max got a really cool voice and and uh and yeah i remember having a lot of fun doing that record i remember uh being bummed i think that was the last record i ever did with them and, and that was a bummer because i really enjoyed them and last one because of just who knows? Who knows? You know? Yeah. People go and do different things or they want to change a pace or they, yeah. Right. Who knows? So you didn't know it was the last record at the time. No, no, uh, no, not at all. Okay. Um, and then that same year, you got the Robert Randolph and the Family Band record. First one. Yes. So, it's and a good year. Those guys were a party to record. Like, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I distinctly remember getting nearly incoherent voicemails from robert that sounded the sounded something like did he just say that he's got a pair of twins at the strip club and we should get down there like and it was at 3 30 in the morning back to the <laughs> i don't know that i want these people in my backyard yeah. at three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> um but uh uh yeah those guys were a really fun those guys were a really fun band just kind of they would just let loose right like and just play Robert just plays all kinds of crazy ass stuff and uh just super fun like super wild and open and, and a blast and I think one of the songs that we did ended up being like a massive song for like pro football or right. some pro sport there was a song called ain't nothing wrong with that and like they played it like on every pro football game for a couple of years or something nice crazy yeah so were you at because at this point your mixing career as a mixer is is pretty well established did you make a conscious effort to keep tracking in amongst it or it's just still the gigs that come or the gigs that come and if you're mixing full-time fine if you're tracking great whatever yeah i mean i was being known as a mixer um and you get pigeonholed as we spoke of so people would stop calling me for tracking because they assumed I was busy mixing. Um, but 
I really enjoy tracking uh, to a point. Like if it's, if it's let's rush and get 300 songs done or, you know, just make it sound like the demo or whatever, that's kind of a bummer. Um, but actually being able to get in there. And I mean, in Nashville, and I don't know, maybe I, my perception is that LA wasn't like this, but in Nashville, it was like, you have 20 minutes to get a drum sound, you know, and then another five to get everything else. Right. Um, and that would get me into trouble because I hated saying, okay, well, I know what the safest way to record these drums is. So I'm just going to put that up to make sure I don't screw it up. And it's not going to be awesome or fun or weird, but it's going to be safe. So I would screw myself because I hated doing that. And I would end up like running around like a crazy person and like making mistakes and painting myself into corners, which if I'm mixing it is fine. If they're sending it to you, you know, they're probably like, you're probably like, what the fuck was this guy thinking? Like these, you know, what the hell is going on with <laughs> With these sessions but i mean that was the time to like try stuff i still do that i i love painting myself in the corners well um, now, you mentioned earlier about how many mics you put on the drums so how many mics do you put on the drums a shitload i put a shit ton of mics on the drums and here's why um like i guess i could sit here and count snare up snare down kick in kick out middle kit Tom, Tom, whatever. I mean, I don't think there should be more than two Toms on a drum kit unless you're, you know, Neil Pert. certain people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should we, we should talk at some point. How the hell did they mic all that shit? Jesus. Um, Single 57. Uh, just, just yeah, really, really just balanced. 57. Yeah. You know, a pair of overheads, a pair of close rooms, a pair of far rooms, a mono mic in front of the kit, a mono mic over the kit, a mic, you know, like that's sitting under the snare drum that runs to a guitar amp, another one that goes to a guitar pedal. Like, I mean, I have shit loads of mics, but the reason why is because what ideally what I want to do is set up three totally different drum vibes on the desk. And depending on what the song is or who needs inspiration, you can just turn the super like hi-fi one off and have one that's like you know a 47 through an 1176 and a little bit of the kick drum and it's just badass and boom and then that's a totally different vibe so i tend to put up way more mics than i need and then hope that if i'm mixing it i know what i want to use and if if i'm not then i try and just inactivate everything that wasn't actually being monitored right um so and that can run you into phase problems and it can run you into issues like that but i try and you know i try and i use lasers to measure my overheads do you so i can yeah I, you know remember how you used to do the mic cable yeah yeah, yeah. I, was, I was like i was like oh i can get this stupid little measurement laser and just and like put it in the middle of the snare drum and at least get my overheads pretty damn close to the equidistant from the snare drum it was an easier way to do it than holding a mic cable yeah um so, but, you know, I, I never got into, I don't know if you do, but I never got into the thing where you're going to do the Mutt Lang where you document absolutely every single thing in the studio. No. I feel like we never had time in Nashville. Um, and when you go to country sessions, country sessions are 10, there's a 10, a two, and a six, right? The downbeat starts at 10 and everybody is basically done by one or so and then there's a two and then if you go late there's a six and it's it is fucking regimented it's like strings in la um you know it's very prescribed and and uh sometimes it's a challenge to do weird shit inside of that you know to keep things interesting right to be like hey i brought another drum kit and i set it up in this like really dead booth and like why don't you go and play on that and we'll make a loop or do something and then we can cut the real drums you know so always keep moving i guess yeah so if you had your choice you would still be recording a couple of records a year as long as it was something that where you had time and dug it obviously but yeah and i still do it, yeah it's it's i i love doing it with people that i love and and you know like stuff like that if it was just you know hey we'll just get whoever to cut whatever like i'm probably not the right guy for that right and what do you think about recording for other producers as opposed to producing yourself? Do you have, do you care? 
as long no, as you uh-uh. and, and I mean that's still I, I'm not I don't do a ton of production so I'm usually recording for other producers um and a lot of times the people that call me to come in and record expect me to I just start producing like I just go for it because if I'm overstepping you can just tell me to chill and I'll chill um but if we find something cool, it makes it a lot more fun, you know, and it makes the project better. So why not go for it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there, there's an aspect of engineering that is technically, it would be production, I guess, if you're messing with the sound, if you're not just capturing what's out there, but that's part of engineering, you know, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all interrelated. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, if we go back into chronological land, I mean, you got, there's another fucking Grammy one. We'll skip that one. All right. But Eric Church, Carolina, we should talk about yeah. that. One of those tracks is on your playlist. Sounds fucking great. Really, really smoke good. Smoke a little smoke. Okay. So what goes around comes around. That's Jay Joyce, right? So for whatever reason, Jay ended up doing the Eric Church record. And because we had worked together before, he called me to mix it and everything ended up working out pretty well. And that became a pretty big record for Eric, who's now, you know, like a big country star. Um, and that was really fun. I, 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 I love working with Jay because he's super creative and super cool. And, and uh, Eric was kind of, even at that point, which is fascinating, he was like, turn the guitars up, fuck it. Like, I don't care what the label thinks, um, which leads to a little bit of an aside. A lot of the records that have done really well or that people have really loved from a creative standpoint have been the records where there hasn't been a lot of involvement outside of the artist and the producer. Um, and I'm not saying that that I'm not looking down on label people. I've worked on a lot of stuff where there's been really great A&R involvement and it's helped a ton, um, you know, but, uh, but that was one where he was just like, I just do things the way I want. So we just kind of went for it. And there were some really great songs that came out of that record. Uh, the track Carolina on that record is actually one of my favorites. And that was one of the records where I put up a song, I pulled up a song and hit play without paying attention. And something went through a big ass reverb, like a big lexicon church. And it made this big glorious sound. And somewhere on that record, I took that and I like flew it and turned it into an intro. And I remember specifically Eric saying, man, that was like super cool. I really love that. And I was like, well, that's why you don't reset between songs, you know? Um, which I remember being a challenge of working in the box because you're a lot of times you're kind of starting with something and there's no there's no randomness to it you know yeah um yeah so yeah so I, that was a great that was a great record that was also done at soundstage on a 9k and and uh same place where we did india same place where we did johnny um and yeah that was that was super cool and then i did we did that and it did well and then we went in and cut and mixed this record for Little Big Town, um, who was kind of like, they were kind of doing this. Uh, and, you know, I think, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they were at the point in their career where they were like, well, fuck it. What's, you know, we're kind of done. What's the worst that can happen? And they crushed it. And everybody just like went to the wall and that song blew up. And the next thing I knew, I was a country guy. Right. <laughs> How about that? But, I mean, that song, that wasn't done like a normal country record, What? right? I mean... No. Um, that was the band, mostly. I think Seth played drums. And I remember cutting that at Sound Emporium. And that was one of the ones where I put, like, a mic underneath the drum kit and ran it through a guitar pedal into a tube amp and put a ribbon mic in front of the tube amp and threw, like, 30 moving blankets on top of it because it was in the drum room. And that specific song, the the crazy snare sound, was that guitar amp, like, just going crazy. Um, and we did all kinds of crazy shit on that record. And I didn't realize until after we had done it, we were doing a charity thing, and I pulled it back up. 
uh, that they sang most of those vocals live on the floor together right. as we tracked it. Yeah. Which is amazing. Um, so yeah, we, we did that. That whole record took like 11 days start to finish, I think. Wow. Which was quick. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's quick in any era. That's yeah. pretty good. I mean, that's like punk record quick. So. <laughs> I thought punk record quick was like well, 12 hours. <laughs> no. Yeah. Actually, I think the fastest record I ever saw get made, and I'm I'm only hijacking this because it's actually a fun story, but I think you'll appreciate it. I was working at a studio in the Bay Area just on a, a summer while I was going to college um, interning, and uh, Los Tigres del Norte came up from Mexico. They drove their bus up, parked in the parking lot. They cut the record in, I think, I think they spent, they might have spent a week cutting the record, but they cut it on 14 inch reels of two inch. So they cut mm -hmm. side A as on one reel as side A, and then they cut side B. And they didn't cut the songs back to back to back, but they like, once they had the first song done, they got the space and like, okay, here's where the second song is going to happen. But then the mixing, they got the first song together and then they rolled the 14 inch reel, a two inch, and then they rolled it 15 inch, a regular reel, a half inch, mix side A, lunch. All right, let's go mix side B and done. Wild. Which is pretty so good. So it was just them just like flying fingers and like... Yeah. Just making it go. Yeah, mixing it like a live show. I mean, obviously the instrumentation was very, very similar. And, like you know, the record was set up to do that. But I love yeah. that that's like, nope, we're mixing side B after lunch. All right. All right. But this goes to something you were talking about with Eric Church. Like, you, you just say sort of offhanded, like, well, you know, he just said, turn the guitars up. We're doing what we want. To a lot of people, that may seem like, well, okay, so we wanted the guitars louder. But I don't think... I'd like you to speak to the homogeny, if that's the right word, of the traditional country record making process and sound and culture in Nashville, because it's fucking serious. It's not, they're not kidding around. Not kidding around. Yeah, the hegemony of homogeny. Um, they're not kidding around. There, there, is a, there is a formula that has been used for a while tried and true um it is only possible because the level of musicianship in this town is kind of bonkers right um like there's great players everywhere but when you so the way nashville does a lot of country records is there's a demo somebody falls in love with the song um which kicks off part of the horror of this process because and horror h o double r the uh uh or both the the when you fall in love with something then you don't want to change it right um and so there's a lot of songs that people would do demos the demos would in nashville until kind of things got pop they would go to a demo studio there's a place called county q and they would have all of these players and they would just play the song down. And the, and that was your demo, right? Good players. Some of the players who were playing on the records, they would play demos when they weren't booked for records. Um, and they would make up stuff on the fly, like a little guitar hook or whatever. So that's the demo. And you would book a session in a studio, get your sounds and everybody would come into the control room and they would say, okay, let's listen to the demo. So usually the session leader would have written the chart, right? And the chart is just national number system, um, 1564, blah, 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 blah. And everybody listened to the demo. I have play it one more time, like make some notes and they go out on the floor and they play it, right? And then usually someone would be like, oh, okay, well maybe we could try this or maybe we could try that. Second or third pass, the song is done. You know, it is just done because these guys are that good at let's just play it. Um, and then somebody, well, why don't we throw a double and you double the acoustic and maybe, you know, throw a couple passes of vocal songs done, come in, let's do the next one. So you can cut seven masters in a day, you know, for sure. Um, the problem is it's paint by numbers and no one's incentivized to be like, Hey, wait a second. What if we did this or let's try that? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. 
and then it works and you have people who have had a ton of number ones basically just reproducing the demo um you know and they're great songs right there's a lot of great songwriters in nashville so you know obviously it all starts with a great song and that becomes that becomes the typical way of doing stuff which kind of drives me crazy you know like i want to be like we're not starting at 10 we're starting at 11 and i'm feeding everybody dinner and let's just rock out you know because you don't want people clock watching like well okay well i've got another session at six across town so i kind of got to wrap this up you know you want right. to play um but it's also it's a way that you can get really high quality records for for in a very efficient time and money space right and it's worked for a lot of people so that's the nashville that's one of the nashville things the the music mill but then you also like sonically turning up the guitars is not something you do you cannot have loud guitars compared to whatever it would be you cannot have a loop that's not the country song anymore that is now a country pop song or and maybe it's relaxed a little bit but i mean i know having to print versions without any programming and like the programming was turned down so much you could barely even tell it was there but like oh no 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 we need to have the country version too like okay right right yes the country version turn the vocal up 60 db um and turn the cool shit off right like it that's changed you know eric church changed it a little bit by just kind of doing the rock and roll thing um when we were doing little big town that that song pontoon we put a ton of slap on the vocal right and the first note that came back was you got to turn all those effects off on the vocal and then to their credit i think it was karen called back a day or two later and was like yeah put it back on right uh and that song was a huge hit and then all of a sudden everybody wanted like super affected vocals right, right. um florida georgia line was doing kind of a poppy country thing it was joey moy who had done nickelback and a bunch of stuff out of vancouver and he had a sound and everybody was like floor georgia line floor georgia line and then chris stapleton hit right, right? and then everyone was like chris stapleton chris stapleton so it's i mean this is nothing new right no no, no. and that been, happens in all genres right it's just it's uh it's chasing and when sam hunt dropped what was basically a pop record you know uh then all of a sudden programming became cool and right. now I actually hear records that sound, they sound like pop records. We just did a, a record a few months ago with this band called Bear, um, B-E-X-A-R, who the songs were pretty much pop. Then there was the occasional like Rezo, right. you know, or Steel or Slide or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that there's a perception um, the perception is we got to do it like this until somebody doesn't do it like that. And then everybody wants to do something different. And, you know, I guess that's just human nature. Yeah. Yeah. And it does, it does happen everywhere. It's just interesting how more defined the country genre is in that respect, in the record making aspects of it. Well, and there's a reason for that. So country is very much dependent on terrestrial radio, right? That was a that's a that was and is a big deal. Like you have to hit terrestrial radio. Um, there isn't a wide uh, distribution network for country. A lot of it is still just radio. So you have gatekeepers who say, "Well, this is what I'm going to play on my radio station," and they get to kind of guide the conversation. Right. Which we've seen happen in other genres, but it's not as prevalent because there's always, you know, other outlets country is still very tied to terrestrial radio right interesting and then sometimes those gatekeepers are super cool and Absolutely. that's a good thing and know. sometimes those gatekeepers take chances because they love something that other people say oh this will never work I, I i distinctly remember the conversations about the chris stapleton stuff and they're like the radio wouldn't play it right this isn't yeah this isn't what we play on radio because florida georgia line was big Right. It was a totally different thing. And then he did that performance with JT. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, the floodgates were open, which was really cool because somebody took a chance on it. It was like, fuck it, let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so. I think part of it is just giving the listening audience enough credit to like what they're going to like, you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the music business runs on fear because uh, you don't want to have a not a hit or you don't want to lose money or you don't want to be the guy who signed whoever. Um, you know, and I get that. That's a very real human emotion and it makes sense. Well, it, um, it's... But then, to my my name for it it's the wheel of blame it's like look for 20 years if you hired anybody lord algae to mix your record if it flopped I, it's like man but I got, mixed I got it, great, man. It you was, know, yeah. so you can't take a chance because then that comes back on you and your name is on the wheel of blame right so and this comes right. from a very real thing which why am i talking about me do you want a little tiny story it's actually funny i love talking okay. about you dude I don't want to talk about me at all. But on the Michael Jackson tour, we actually had a wheel of blame. And it was like a wheel of fortune thing. And everybody's name was on it. But like you would you could get your name taken off, but you could also get your name put on more than once. And so at one point late in the tour, there was somebody whose name was on there like 12 times. Oof. And every time every time we'd set up the gig, it was one of the first things out of the cases once the stage was built. Spin the wheel and everything that went wrong that day was that guy's fault. Or girl, or goes equal, equal opportunity, right? But yeah, yeah, no, the yeah, the wheel of blame, and I get it. I mean, that's cover your ass is a very human thing. Yeah, and uh, and I totally get it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't lead to art innovation. Yeah, it doesn't lead to art. Um, or it can. I mean, there is art in it sometimes, but it certainly doesn't fan the embers. Yeah. Um, you know, so. I mean, and that's the push pull. I, I've always said the internet, the inner, the intersection of art and commerce is a, there's a lot of wrecks in that intersection. <laughs> yeah. But also it's ridiculous to say like, man, we should all just make art because it is commerce. It is, it's the music business we're talking about. If you just yeah. want to make your music at home, totally cool. And if you can yeah. manage to record it and get some people to buy it on your own, great. But if you want to be in the music business, it's a business. So yes, it's not show friends. It's show business. <laughs> Though sometimes it is only show friends, which is a real shame if you're yeah, having a bad day. All right. <laughs> so, so uh, just another Grammy winning record following on here. Yeah. I mean, speaking of Grammys, speaking of Grammys, let me what? talk about someone who's won like 20 of them. Well, you know, <laughs> what's up, Andrew? How, How are, are you? Doing? What's going I'm on, good, Pete? man. We got a lot of beards here right now. We yeah. do. We do. The beard game is strong. It yeah, is strong. Yeah, that's, that's strong. for sure. So you you talk to Andrew for two minutes while I get a glass of water. Oh, I was just, okay, I'll, ju I'll jump in, I guess. I was just heading out the door. I was coming to see what the heck was going on. Well, I'm just talking to F. Reed Shippen, you know. Wow. You've got some insane modular stuff going on behind you. That's I do. amazing. I do. I'm very excited about it. It's my wow. I've had the the synth for a while, but that is I got some furniture built, the, those cases built recently, and it's amazing. That is so cool. cool. I'm really afraid to go down that rabbit hole because I think I would just get really obsessed. It is an endless rabbit hole. It really yeah. is. I I would say if you ever feel like you want to, don't try and do it from scratch. Like I started, I found a system on eBay from a sound designer in LA, like a film sound designer guy and started with that. And that was like enough yeah. modules that I could go for a year without buying anything else. And like, that's the oh. way to do it. Because if you start from scratch, you, you'll spend so much money and it's, yeah. Yeah. It's insane. How wow. much do you love the work that Gorenson was doing on Mandalorian with the modular synth stuff? <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say though, man, I, I wanted to like Mandalorian more than I ended up liking it. It was a little, it was a little kids show for me. I was expecting a little more. I think it got, it got built up too much for me is the yeah. problem. I'm going to let you guys get back to it. I'm going to go watch my son do karate. So awesome. I'll, yep. I'll see you guys later. All right. Good you. Nice. For stopping in. See, most of the time when people have to go get a drink or get rid of a drink, I just get left on my own and I got to do things like show people my <laughs> toothpick. You know, like it, this show gets really boring. So that's nice having. Yeah, well, you know, and that's something else. Like, it's really nice to be in 
a building where there are some other people where when you're done driving yourself crazy on something, you can go and talk about bullshit or sit outside or be like, dude, come and listen to this and make sure that I'm not losing it. Like that, that is an aspect um, that I really like. It's huge. I mean, that was a gigantic part of recording studios is very few of them had one room and didn't have other people coming in and out. Yeah, and we were both yeah. lucky enough to start when that was the thing. Yeah, yeah, I was, you know, and it, it's a uh, you're by yourself, right? Does it ever drive you crazy to not have that, you know? Well, I mean, I've been working at home for so long that I'm used to it, so it doesn't drive me crazy. But yeah, I lose perspective constantly, constantly. Yeah. Nightmare. What do you do to reset? work on another song or do something else and hope for the best yeah. just step out of it yeah yeah but i've i've also structured things now where unless somebody comes to me and says there is a real deadline i never say when i'm doing something because i'm not using gear like it doesn't matter so right. my i just say when can you get me files and when do you have to have it and if i feel like i can get it done in that time frame i will and it might take me two weeks to get you something. You might get something tomorrow. I have no idea how quickly I'll be able to figure it out, but yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Same here. Um, and th that's kind of freeing, you know, um, I like that until like things go wrong and then you get into trouble and then you realize everybody wants everything on that Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the good thing is, and I think we're probably the same with this is as much as like, we don't want to be pressured to have to do it by a certain time. We're also both workaholics in the sense of we're not going to go like hang out at the bowling alley for three days when we know we've got shit to do. We're going to do it because then we can right. enjoy the bowling alley. Not like we're going bowling anytime soon, global pandemic and all, but, um, well, yeah. I live in Tennessee. Oh, so there's no pandemic there. No. Oh, fantastic. How lucky no, for you. Not really. Yeah. That's amazing. That's one word for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, that's true. And there, I mean, I feel a pressure. I, I will tell a story that makes me sound slightly douchey because it involves the word Lamborghini, but the, uh, <laughs> um, an old friend of mine has a Lamborghini, nice. which he bought some years ago because he decided that he had worked really hard and wanted a Lamborghini. Um, he is the least Lamborghini person that I know. Um, he drives it because he thinks it's a work of design brilliance. And like, you know, it's fun. He also says like, it's, it's not like you get a Lamborghini to drive around town. It's a point A to point A car. You like, you hit the wrong parking ramp and you tear the front off and it's like 15 grand to fix yeah. it. So he's like, it's not like you go drive it for fun. Um, but he had a track day. There was a charity thing for Parkinson's disease. And he was like, dude, do you want to come up and just like ride and drive and let's do this track thing? So we drove up to Bowling Green, um, which is hour and a half away or hour plus. It's where the National Corvette Museum is. And we were driving on the track, which is terrifying. You want to, you want to know what's intimidating? Driving on a racetrack for the first time in your friend's <laughs> Lamborghini, right? You're like... I, please don't fuck up. Please don't fuck up. Um, so then, of course, it's on Friday. I get a call from a client, and they said, hey, the song that they said was due Monday, it's due today. And I was like, you know, I had, before I allowed myself to leave town, and I made sure to triple check everything was cool. We're not going to hold anybody up. So long story short... I ended up in an Uber going back to Nashville so I could finish the song by end of day so that we could turn it in, you know? And uh, I did, did not want to do that, but that's the gig. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, you if, know, you hadn't, and was, uh, if you hadn't gotten it done that day, it wouldn't have mattered. I'm sure. I'm sure it's still sitting on, in somebody's email now. You know, I it's but the artist was getting pressure from their label 
tell them no, no, it's, it's a, you know, it's a service business. So yep. I did what I need to do. And I skipped like a half a day of driving fast cars and came and did my job. Well, look, speaking of a service so, business, you, you had a, a, an interesting thing. And I'm wondering if you still do this. So when you were starting out mixing, as far as I know from the internet, you offered a hundred percent refund if people were not happy with the mix. I would love to see that on the internet. That does sound like something that I would do. Okay. Um, you know. So that's not true then. Well, again, I probably did that at some point. Um, I don't particularly remember it, but I, I, I think that probably that story came out of me offering that to certain people. Right. 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 You know, like if you don't like this, you could have your money back. And I've done that. You know, if someone really hates something or um you know it's just like hey sometimes you're not the guy right? absolutely uh and that's fine and it's it um, makes you feel much better to give the money back and stop working on it than to hold on to it and try and continue yeah especially when you know you can go down a rabbit hole now there have been times when i've deliberately zigged and they wanted zag but they didn't mention that they wanted zag right so it's like well if you had let me know that going in i probably would have zagged instead of zigging and and we can recover it and there's always clients who like get freaked out and they're like oh my gosh this is so totally wrong it's totally wrong um and uh and i don't know that there's anything you can do to bring their confidence back and i don't know that it's worth it sometimes you just have to like judge the person i guess yeah um I did a record for this indie kid uh, and the first mix or two that we had done like months ago, he was over the moon. It was the best thing ever. And it was amazing. And he's like, I want you to like this next set. I really want you to like do really cool shit. And like, whatever you hear, man, it's amazing. And then I sent in one mix and he was, he was like livid, right? <laughs> Who, how dare he do this and do that and do the other thing. You know, this is, he told me, he's like, this is unlistenable. You've totally ruined all of my art and like all of this stuff. Wow. And I think all I did was like, you know, like put a, a loop in like a breakdown or something like, you know, and, and my speech is always like, look, if you don't like it, we can just turn it off. It's not, I'm not, I'm not married to this. I don't, this right. isn't my baby. Right. Like I want it to be great, but I want it to be great for you. It's your record. Yeah, of course. Um, and then what do you do? What do you do in that situation? You just say, okay, man, go with God. Like, I, I can't help you with that, especially someone who can't recover, you know, who yeah. can't think about it. You know, it's just like, all right, you're a child next. <laughs> all right. So look, we were just about to speak about another Grammy winning record you were involved in, uh, the Chris Tomlin record. Oh yeah. Chris. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That I Grammy. remember, I remember meeting Chris meeting Chris at Matt Bronley's studio and he was just this, you know, dude in a jean jacket and super nice and, you know, super eager. And who knew he was going to turn into like this massive, massive star in the Christian worship world. Like he's huge. Um, yeah. I mean, Chris, Chris would have come through a lot of those other records that I did and, you know, his stuff was, kind of the singer songwriter with a little bit of the pop thing. And, and uh, um, I think, I, I mean, I, I've done a bunch of, st I, I had done a bunch of stuff with Chris back in the day. Uh, so um, that was in the, that was in the mode where it was just like, you know, Hey, I, you know, I know what I'm doing. I know what the market wants. He knows that I know what the market wants and we just, you know, knocked it out and it worked really well. Right. All right, and followed by another Grammy-winning record, the Toby Mac Eye on It. Toby, yeah. So I've known Toby for a really long time. And, um, you know, he's a, he's a very shrewd business guy and a very good dude. Um, and we had worked on – I had worked on tons of stuff with Toby for over a long, a, a long period of time. Why that record ended up uh, – winning i don't know i remember i mean i used to give toby shit because there was one there was one year where i think i had three of the five records in the category up for the grammys <laughs> and one of the other two was a toby mac live record like a concert record and that won the grammy <laughs> and you're just like oh come on you know but 
I yeah, I love Toby. He's a he's an innovator and he's a sharp guy and um, he's always fun to work with. All right then. Your answers are getting shorter, which means I think we're gonna well, but no, Sorry. but I'm gonna bring up some. No, it's fine. It's fine. I I feel like I'm wearing you out a little bit though, and I don't want to do that because we got we got plenty more to talk about. But let's let's skip a couple of things here because I want to get to some of the more recent stuff. But I don't want to skip over. Well, KS Rhodes, you've got a track on your your playlist from that record, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Isn't so that fun? Good. Yeah, like he does such cool music. Um, and he was part of a group called 10 out of 10. That was a bunch of like indie artists that we all kind of hung around with and we all kind of worked on stuff. And, and, um, I remember, uh, uh, chaos was annoying to work with because, uh, he's very particular and he's not particularly good at expressing that in a way that's calm. All right. <laughs> um, perfect. But he, he's kind of Kubrickian as well because he works really really hard on these sonic and you know musical collages that are just beautiful in their messiness um and it was just really fun and really challenging and uh and just really fun to listen to you know right um like i can go back and listen to that and enjoy it um and not uh and not be like oh man i wish i'd turn that slide guitar up <laughs> good good I, I hope you don't you don't go back to too much of your stuff thinking you wanted to turn things up or down oh dude i i hate everything like i you know uh, yeah. it takes me a long time to be able to listen to something or the best part is when you're walking through a store when we used to be able to do that or something and you hear this song and you're like this sounds pretty good you know it's a good mix. I should look this up when I get home. And then you're like, this song is familiar. How do I know this? And then you realize, oh yeah, I mixed it. <laughs> that's kind of a cool, that's a fun realization. I'm it sure is. you've had a ton of those. Uh, not a ton, not a ton. And I, to be honest, it's usually stuff that happened a long time ago. Like it's nothing recent would make me feel that mm -hmm. way. Cause it's all too, yeah, the pain is too real. But it, you know, it is, it is nice to inadvertently listen to something unguarded yeah and be like oh yeah hey that's pretty cool and then realize oh my god i actually did that you know so that's yeah that's gratifying definitely to not beat yourself up over everything <laughs> yeah yes yes and difficult to do but it's it's good to try um all right let's talk about ingrid michelson for a minute yeah ing she's awesome i love her voice i really do um, and, uh, um, you know, she's just, she is such a good storyteller and, and, um, she has a certain way of looking at things. That's really fun that I really enjoy. Um, so doing those couple records with her, uh, was, was great. Although it's funny, it actually, we can talk about this. It, it led to me not doing records with her because um, I had done a bunch of Ingrid records. And, you know, when you're working with people, everyone's like, you're the guy, you're our guy, you know, right, like whatever. It's all working. And, and I, you know, I, I love being part of a team because when you hit a groove, you end up doing a lot of great work. Right. Um, but there was some record, and I think it was like a Christmas record and they wanted me to mix it. And I started it and they hated it. And then they were like, well, what we really wanted was something that was like old school, like throwback. It's like, okay, again, might've mentioned that, you know, before you hand me something that the last couple records were pretty much pop. And I say, oh, well, they must want the same vibe, right? Yeah. And it became one of those things where it was, it was not recoverable. Right. Like they had lost faith in the direction or maybe I just wouldn't wasn't going to get it or didn't get it or right. I don't know, you know, because right. then I went back and I was like, OK, I'm going to do this a little more mono and put a bunch of EMT plate on it and like kind of do the old throwback thing. But whatever. And then that that record, you know, they went and did it with someone else, which is fine. But then you get that you get that feeling like I bet you they're not going to call me again. Right. And I haven't heard from them since, you know. And that's just the way it works. 
it yeah. hurts and it sucks. Um, you know, but it's also just kind of, it's kind of part of it. Um, you know, and I can beat myself up about everything, but you know, stuff like that just kind of gets under my skin and then you go, well, any given Sunday, right? Who the yeah. Hell yeah. Look, and I think it's interesting. Some people's take on that, not in terms of the, um, you know, working on some records and having it go well, then one doesn't go well. And can you recover from it sort of thing? But like Steve Lillywhite was talking about with you two at the beginning of their career, he made the first two records and then they were going to make the third record with someone else and it didn't quite work out. So they came back to him. And then finally, he's like, look, I get to make records with lots of different bands. You guys need to go make records with other producers. Like you've got to go experience more of the record making universe and things. So it, it is like the inside out version of that. But in a way, it's like your downfall was that they were only they only had the context of the records you had done for her instead of listening to your entire catalog and knowing you could do the retro thing, no problem if asked to do it, but you assume they wanted more of what you had been doing. So that's not recoverable, but at the same time, maybe they get to go do something else that wouldn't have happened or something. So it, yeah. it is a drag. And with you too, you too and Lily White, I mean, that process continued. Yeah. Um, oh, he ended up, you know, coming back all the time. He was the guy who could finish records because he had the history with him. I mean, yeah. you know, now the way he talked about it when they started, the age difference was gigantic. He was an adult. They were in high school, basically. Obviously, five records in, that age difference means absolutely nothing, but he still had that place in their musical family. He was dad coming in to help finish the record. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, and you know, it's those are all learning experiences. And they're also... Um, there's a great quote from Mandela that says, I never lose, I either win or I learn. Um, and that that is absolutely true. And and as it hurts to it hurts to lose records, but sometimes it just brings great opportunity. The after the ridiculous success of the little big town record, right? That record blew wide open. Yeah. I got fired on the next record twice. <laughs> and, okay so you obviously got rehired once <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i got fired i got rehired i got fired um and that hurt that really pissed me off right and that really hurt um because it's like you know what is it guys are we not going to make a hit record because we just made the biggest record of your entire career um but so that happened and i was bummed and there was a huge hole in my schedule because I we had set aside time to do this thing. And then the phone rings and it's Kenny Chesney. Who's next like, on hey, my list to ask you about? I was wondering if you if we could mix some stuff. And we ended up doing this record that was really fun and different with him. And I've done a bunch of records since. Interestingly, I, at one point I asked him, I was like, how did you come to call me? And he was like, oh, I was on the bus with Eric Church. And he was like, dude, you should call this shipping guy, man. He would crush this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, so if I hadn't gotten canned on Little Big Town, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with Chesney, who I really enjoy working with. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that that's the that's that's the flow man like that shit just happens yeah yeah absolutely it, it and it's important i mean because you, you've made a bunch of records with him and i'm sure some of his records are what have led to other records as well i'm sure which yeah. little big town wouldn't have led you to you know it would have been different so you know but it's still it's difficult and it's like the uh the thing in relationships like one positive thing five negative things you know that kind of deal and it's it's i assume that it's the same for you but for me it's it's the things i do right yeah yeah that's great the things that i don't do right i beat myself up for oh absolutely you know, like I, constantly i can relive every single time i have failed in public since i like was four years old i could relive every single one of those moments right now for you 
you know, easy, easy. Wow. And I'm glad I, but my I, memory sucks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's better that way. It is better that way. But I think it's also it goes back to something you were saying before about um, <laughs> your friend who said that you know basically the goal is to be the best in the world. And so that's something we're all pushing for. I mean, we really are always trying to be the best in the world. And the problem is the someone who's the best in the world can't possibly get fired from something. So it's like this actual concrete reinforcement of the fact that you are not the best in the world. But nobody's the best in the world. So it doesn't matter. It's But it is very, very difficult to deal with because that is an actual failure. Right. If you let well, it and, be one, you know. And it's perspective because I, I made fun of him after he said that. Right. And he was like, but dude, you're the best in the world. Like you are the best. You're at the top of your game. And I was like, my immediate thought was like, no, there's like 300 people who are better than me. Um, but from a certain way of looking at it, it's like, yeah, we have the privilege of being in the top, you know, whatever you want to call it. 1%, 5%, whatever. Like, and that's amazing. And then, of course, we are having this conversation. I was having this conversation with a guy who owns a fucking Lamborghini. So, you know, <laughs> whatever, dude. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's never enough. Uh, finding a way to appreciate that on a regular basis is, is a constant challenge for me. Um, and I, I, I would do well to be more cognizant of my successes and, and hold on to my failures less. Well, yeah, I mean, look, we all have that issue, and your successes are many, many, and fucking awesome, too. I mean, you know, going through the playlists and going through your discography and just listening through stuff, it made me angry. Like, I need to come beat you up. <laughs> like, uh, it's... Well, well, after we have that fight, can we have beers? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We could have beers during the fight, because I have no interest in actually fighting so yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah, I'm all about the beers. But it's, I mean, you're really, really, really fucking good. It's not like there isn't a fluke in there that's like led to some more work and you're skating under the radar and like, no, no. Yeah, Innovating yeah, and bad. good and changing and also really sympathetic to things. Like we're going to skip ahead right now because let's talk about the Gloria Gaynor record. Oh, gosh. Because holy yeah. shit. Dude, this woman is a badass and she's 77 okay so here here's what you need to know about glory gainer we did this record uh we did it a, a while ago it took her a little time to find the right partner and it finally came out or whatever but what you really need to know about glory gainer is i co-founded a charity with a friend of mine called song farm yes, and the point of this charity wanted to talk to, about so let's do it now yeah i mean it was to get like Arts, arts in the schools over here sucks. We wanted to, my co-founder Ross, you know, he had a teacher that really changed his life by encouraging him to be creative. And, you know, so we wanted to give that to kids and we talked about putting a studio in his school. And then I was like, you know, if we can do one studio in one school, we can do a thousand studios in a thousand schools, right? Cause that's, it's so easy. Yeah. Um, uh, but a friend of mine runs a thing in New York called the MIC and it was kind of an open mic night like thing that they do every so often and they identify a charity. So he's like, if you want to do one for song farm, like that would, we're totally down. I was like, man, that's so nice. Right. Open auction, whatever. I just asked Gloria, would you come and sing a song? And a 77 year old fucking legend dragged her ass into New York city and went to the knitting factory and sang a couple of songs with this group of people. Wow. You know, and that is Gloria Gaynor. Like that is unbelievable that she did that. Um, such an incredible woman. She sang like three quarters of those songs. She sang with the band in the studio. We cut that whole thing to two inch. Um, it was just casting a bunch of great players and, uh, and man, just having fun. And, you know, I, I guess it, it showed because that was so that was my my first Grammy Award for actually producing. Dude, co -producing. And if anyone thinks you can't do a throwback thing, they need to listen to this record because it's <laughs> it is it is modern, but it's got such a, like the track you put on your playlist. Joy comes in the morning. The drums 
are so fucked up and awesome on that track. Thanks. It, well, okay, so all, all fairness, that was Daru, right? And uh, Daru and I got into a little bit of a scuffle because I was like, all right, we're, we're doing this old school thing. You know, here's my um, 56 Slingerland kit, right? Let's use that. He's like, no, I use my drums, right? His drums are not throwback. His drums are like fucked up weird modern, which are awesome. But they were really difficult to make it work with that music. Um, but he doesn't, pl he plays like Daru and he sounds like Daru. And then me working to kind of bring it somewhere on the in-between turned out to be a really great uh, thing, even though it was initially a little annoying um, to have to fight that fight. Um, but that's okay. Cause you know, I mean, that's the thing about making records is you roll with it. Right. Yeah. You figure it out. Um, but it was fun watching, you know, Daru's Daru plays with Jack white and he's done some really cool stuff. And, and, uh, it was fun getting him in the studio and he didn't really know who he was playing with. And Drew and Shannon were there. Drew was playing guitar and, um, you know, Willie Weeks was playing bass and Daru figured out about two minutes into the first song that he was in the presence of some shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Willie, I mean, Willie's an incredible, he's an icon of bass playing. And, and uh, the ironic thing is we ended up doing that at Dave Cobb's place at RCAA and, and there's this API. And on the side, there was this Rod Stewart record where he's, you know, he's not wearing a shirt. He's wearing this big headdress like and and i was like okay this is a little this is a little uh much for me to sit here and stare at so i just turned it over so i wouldn't have to look at rod stewart in all being all rod stewart and on the back are the credits and the bass players fucking willie weeks and i was just like oh my god seriously um but yeah that was a really fun record really fun record to do and it was really gratifying to see her recognized for something that uh wasn't a cover song yeah right um and you know she does not sound like she's 77 no. singing no i mean look there are a lot of name recognition grammys because that's just the way people vote and stuff like that yeah. so you know whatever but but no that that is an artist making a record regardless of age or whatever and i gotta say i i have a feeling that the drum fight is has made the drums even cooler than they would have been if you'd just gone with the Slingerland because it's it is this thing. It's a and it's almost a signature, but it's it's like it's the updated thing, the updated yeah. version of what easily could have been a let's pretend we made it back then. It's obvious it wasn't made then, but it's also obvious that you know exactly what was going on back then. So. Yeah, it was really cool. Like I said, it was annoying at the time, but it was cool that it worked out and it was a learning experience, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, what a what a fun project to be in. in so how'd that gig come about? Um, it came about because she had been talking or writing with my friend Chris Stevens, who's the co-producer, right? And And she was like, well, let's do a record. And he called me and he was like, look, I have no idea really because how to go into the studio and do a live band. Right. Like, cause he had done a lot of Toby Mac stuff. He had done, he's a programmer. He's a, you know, producer. He's a really talented musician um, and a keyboard player. And, and he plays a ton of different instruments, but he's like, this is not how I do records. This is, you know, how to do records like this. So I got to cast it and you know, get people in the studio and set them up in a way that they can all communicate and then also tell them like hey we're doing this to analog tape so you know don't fuck up um which is actually more like we're doing this to analog tape and you watch the musicians kind of like you know all right let's do this like i'm i'm down um and it takes a lot of the second guessing out of it because when it feels good it is good and we're done right right uh and we just did it together that's how it happened like you know uh and chris brought the thing that he's great at and i brought the thing that i was great at and it all kind of like blended together yeah it's a great record it really thanks. is it, it's thanks yeah all of it um all right 
I feel like we've skipped a bunch of stuff. Do we talk about Dirks Bentley yet? We haven't talked about no, Dirks. We haven't. We better. Yeah. Right. Um, again, I you know I feel fortunate that I get to work with people who are so cool. Um, you know, Dirks is a super nice guy, um, and we we went in and the first record we did was the Riser record. I actually mentioned it earlier. Like I, you know, I didn't know him from Adam. Uh, and, but I knew my buddy, my buddy Ross, who we ended up doing the charity with, you know, later, like we're going to go in and cut this thing. And I was like, fine, let's just have fun. So one of the first songs we cut on that record, the title cut, I, you know, I set up probably that same Slingerland kit in a little drum overdub and not even a drum overdub, like a vocal booth. And we were screwing around in the song and I told the drummer, I was like, dude, why don't you run in here and just knock it out on this little kit and then we'll add drums later. And that turned into the basis of that entire song. Um, and that like led to a really cool tune. Like it, it turned out the song Riser is like really cool. Um, and in fact, the guy who wrote that song, Travis Meadows is going through some really hardcore medical stuff right now. So if you Google Travis Meadows, like go fund me, if anybody feels like helping him out do it because that sucks um so we ended up going in i think we did that record at ocean way and and cutting a bunch of stuff and that led to um some success and the next record well, there was a song on it called drunk on a plane mm -hmm. and uh, we were in this studio we had a shouting match me and ross and dirks because you know, I was like, this song is a number one hit and I absolutely 100% guarantee it. Like this song is a fucking smash. And Dirks is like, I don't know if I want to put it on the record. It's, you know, I don't know. I don't want to be cheesy. I was like, be cheesy and have a number one record. Like this song is awesome. <laughs> and uh, he ended up releasing it. It was huge. Like it was a massive hit. Um, and the reason why is because it was fun and he's good at making fun of himself. Yeah. You know, Um I kind of think he's like the, I, I've, I've told him this, that he's like the Dave Grohl of country where <laughs> like, you know, he wants, he's making good music and he's deadly serious about being an artist, but he's also not afraid to make fun of himself. Right. You know? Um, and I like that, that, that it's kind of a disarming thing. So we've done a bunch of records together and, and back to what we were talking about. He is right now cutting a new record without me and without Ross. Um, because at some point an artist needs to go, try other stuff you know and it's like part of me is like oh that's a bummer because mainly because i really enjoy working with dirks right he's a lot of fun and i really like his voice and you know he picks great songs and all of that and then part of me is happy because it's like dude you know yeah branch out um like i'm not i'm not sweating i know that i'm not I guess I know that he's not doing that because he didn't like what we did. He's doing that to just try and expand his right. boundaries. So, yeah, I love Dirk Bentley. He's fucking awesome. Yeah. And I do believe you have done a, uh, a very fine mixing video about that song, too. Oh, yeah. So there's this thing called Pure Mix, um, and it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, we did do Drunk on the Plate. Although, you know, it's funny. Um, country traditionally has the vocal cranked the vocal on that track is buried um almost a little too much now that i go back and listen to it i was like really did i really put it that low but it made the song feel huge it is gigantic on radio. It yeah is. it just feels huge and when you crank the vocal it turns the song down so maybe one of the reasons why it had impact is because you know, the vocal wasn't loud. And the same thing with the Chris Stapleton we were talking about happened. Everybody has to have the vocals up and then Drunk on a Plane is this massive hit. And then everyone's like, oh, I guess it's okay if the vocals aren't cranked. Right. Um, so, you know, any given Sunday. Well, you're a trendsetter. I've always said that about you. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, even lately there's just been a ton of shit like okay so zach brown last record yep anything yep. in particular you want to talk about that uh no i mean that was one of those things where i i feel like zach's record he did a bunch of stuff with a bunch of people and i happened to be one of the people that got 
that got a shout for a couple of tunes on that record. You know, Zach's always, I think, been interested in like looking around and looking in dusty corners and trying new things. Yeah. Same with Keith Urban. Um, you know, you, you never know. Keith's going to Keith's going to do stuff with his dudes here and then he's going to do stuff with Jay and then he's going to go do stuff with Eric Valentine, um, you know, which I highly support because Eric's like a badass. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's 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 fun to be included in stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. He's very, very eclectic, which is great. Um, but then also Sammy Hagar. Come yeah. on, Sammy. All right. Okay. So I met Sammy at Kenny Chesney's birthday party. Of course you did. Of course. Hi, I have a Lamborghini and I'm a douche. Um, <laughs> and Max, if you're watching this, you're a douche because you have a Lamborghini. Uh, so, and I did the thing that I really don't do ever, which is germing right so i was just like look <laughs> i am so sorry however i fucking love your shit like you know like i i mean van halen is a bifurcated band right uh yeah david lee roth is unquestionably one of the greatest frontmen of all time yeah insanely entertaining and just like like a pillar of a rock in my childhood is 1984 and a couple of records before that right like unquestioned and i know that there's a lot of controversy about when he left and sammy hagar took over um and that's fine but there's two things you have to know about sammy hagar the guy can sing his ass off definitely not david lee roth david lee roth was more of a showman yeah, he's a totally really good different. singer but he's you're totally different but he's a Hagar writes great pop shit and he would take the pop shit and Van Halen would take, and they would just do something. I just really love those records. Right. So we drank some tequila and I kind of germed him. And then I started talking about the fact that um, I really love the way that he would do stuff where it would start off minor in the verses and they would switch to majors in the choruses. And we talk about this, that, and then he was like, you really know this stuff, don't you? I was like, unquestionably, I never germ anyone, but I am germing the <laughs> fuck out of you, dude, because I just love that shit. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, however you think of me, before, during, or after, fuck it. I, I, I love, uh, I love fifty one fifty. Um, so it's so many memories of cranking that with the windows down in Jersey. You know, like totally. So. Um, we ended up talking about stuff and, and, uh, and drinking I, I, a lot of tequila, which he knows a lot about, as you know. Yeah, well, he um, has his own. He did. He was actually, it, I think right? he was the first celebrity exit on a tequila company. Right. Um, when he sold Cabo Wabo. That was like the first big celebrity tequila company. And he's very knowledgeable, by the way, about the spirit and about Mezcal and about all that stuff. Um, so he, he just called me and said, hey, do you want to mix a few songs? I was like, are you fucking kidding? So yeah, we did some tunes. Um, you know, again, a really nice guy. Really fun. That's great. I love that the the actual work part of that was like nine words. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it needs to be. That's yeah, I mean, it you know, be. it's that's the, the fun part was I just, you know, dude, putting Sammy Hagar on the resume was like, oh, are you kidding? Mm. So much fun. <laughs> Well, look, we've talked about a hell of a lot of records. I want to talk a little bit about your studio, which you are okay. sitting in, Robot yes. Lemon. Because the way we're not facing has an SSL. You've got a shit ton of outboard gear. Um, oh, I yeah, think we're moving. We're moving. Pivot. Including a Fairchild. Including a Fairchild. Sort of. Which is a very child. fine investment, even if it weren't amazing. Yeah. And here's, I, I'm I'm tethered, but here's like part of the ssl part of the ssl yeah okay so so you have said in other interviews and we don't have to go into this if you don't want to but you've said in other interviews and people say so like hey man you got this hybrid set up and and you're like dude I, we need hours to explain this well we have hours if you want to explain <laughs> your setup okay i realized way back when when i was in soundstage working on an 80 input j that the 
people were going to come back and ask for changes ad nauseum, ad infinitum. Uh, and it that's no problem. But recall, actually, no. This story starts with Tommy Sims. All right. And this was actually before Soundstage. This is when I was at Recording Arts um, on an E. And I was mixing Tommy's record. And I got a song done. And this is back when, you know, it was Recall, right? And I called him and I said, yo, Tom, I got, you know, I have a tune done. And he was like, dig, dig, I'll be down there and I'll be down there in a couple hours. That was Tuesday afternoon. He got there Thursday night, right? Meanwhile, I was sitting around because I didn't want to take the song down. No. Nope. Because I know it was Tommy and we were going to tweak it. And then never and comes any back moment, he was going to walk in the fucking door, right? Um, but after that, I was like, I can't wait around on dude on dude like this is killing me i could have gotten two other songs done you know and now i'm all backed up and whatever so when i went to soundstage i started thinking about how could we do this in a way that i could mix the way i wanted to mix but have recall really fast because a majority of the stuff was a majority of the recalls were could you turn this up a little bit could you move this little thing a little bit whatever and every once in a while, they're like, I hate the drums. And it's like, okay, if you hate the drums, let's just fucking remix the song, right? Like, you know. Yeah. So what I figured out was I could have the SSL and over on the wing, I could have like 16 stereo stems or maybe it was eight stereo stems. I think it was 16. Uh, and what I would do is I would mix to buses and bring it back on the stems at zero. And I had a second Pro Tools system that would just print the stems. And what I quickly figured out was if I use that Pro Tools system and leave the converters on input, which were probably radar converters, right? Because there was a million radars. It was really easy to get a bunch of converters. If I leave those on input, then whatever the converters change, I would be automatically compensating for as I mixed because I was mixing through the converters. And then when right. I recorded it and hit playback, it would sound exactly the same because I tried printing, you know, you've done this too. You print stems and you line them up and it doesn't sound the same right um and we can have a whole conversation about that because i'm i still have two minds on that shit but um so that was the first iteration and somebody would call and be like can we have the backgrounds up in the chorus and i would just you know open that system turn the backgrounds up one db print it be done and that still let me have all my parallel stuff because it was all running parallel anyway like analog right um so I didn't have to, have to actually bounce down the parallels. They were just running live. So that began the process of thinking through, like, what if I set up a studio where a lot of the analog stuff I was using was running through another set of converters so that I was listening through the converters. So anything that changed, I'd be compensating for. And then when I'm done with the song, I can print most of that into Pro Tools. And the thing that actually recalls is whatever analog summing there is and a couple of parallels, right? That's what eventually turned into the hybrid studio that I'm sitting in, um, which is, you know, fairly complicated, probably completely unnecessary, right? <laughs> um, but it works. And this is something, honestly, Andrew, like, I, like I'm half tempted when they let me in the country to fly the hell over there and pour as much beer as possible into you so we can have conversations about mixing in the box and mixing out of the box. And, you know, like, I know your perspective on that. Well, yeah, um, I mean, and we can do some of that right now if you want. But it's, yeah. I, it's I think, and you've said this about your own studio, it's whatever makes you feel creative while you're mixing. It doesn't matter what it is. Right, right. And, and you know, I'm working on three or four things right now. One of them is all in the box. It's that big Disney project. The one I'm doing today is the drums are running through the SSL because they sound cooler like that. But I turned the Fairchild off because I didn't need it. Then another song I did was completely in the box because I thought that the song would sound better if I did it completely digital. Um, but, you know, and then to be honest, there's a psychological crutch aspect of it because I'm used to the way everything sounds and I'm used to the way that it's routed. 
And it's really easy for me to throw this through here and that through here and that through here. And I know what I'm going to get and I like it. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a fear factor of, okay, how do I convert that into working in the box and not slow myself down yeah. a lot? And I think that the answer to that is probably what you went through, which is a lot of trial and error. Yeah, it's a lot right? of work and it's terrifying. No question. Yeah. yeah. So I know I can do it because I've done songs in the box that worked really, really well. And But there's a part of me that's just like, I don't want to. I don't well, want to. Well, and, uh, and you don't have to. I mean, but look, no. for me, the answer to any question about whether you can mix in the box, the answer is Chad Blake. So, yes, yeah. obviously you can. And you can make cool sounding records and be creative and whatever. But it's it's not about what you use it's about how quickly can you be happy with what you're doing right and, and it's also creative. there's a confidence there's yeah. a confidence thing yeah um you know but yeah you're right dude the chad blake end of story done but at the same time right. there's also the the terror of you know if i'm not using the gear then what separates me from everybody else and of course the answer is your ears like I couldn't walk into your studio and make shit sound the way you do. It's impossible. Yeah. But that's a very hard thing to get over, especially with the imposter syndrome. And like, you know, that Fairchild, not everybody's got a Fairchild. Yeah. But Yeah, and, but, and you know, I'm a big proponent of the, whatever tools work, right? Yeah. Now, so the the reason why I skirt this question in interviews is because explaining especially if you actually went granular on that explaining how everything is patched and routed and everything is is convoluted and difficult um i spent a long time figuring it out and then subsequently forgot half of it right so i'm, I'm scared to change anything because i probably couldn't put it back right. um <laughs> but at the end of the day when i finish a song I, we do something called, that we call rendering it, right? So most of it gets printed into Pro Tools and there's a few analog, if there's analog summing that's happening, there's some there's some parallels that happen, but I can open and tweak songs and, you know, like we can open and tweak 10 songs in a day, no problem. Right, right. Because right. the, um, the analog stuff that's left over is not changing. Right. It's the the, what goes into it is what changes. Right. So when I change stuff, like on vocals, my thing on vocals is I really love I've got one, two, three, four, five different compressors on five faders, and I like to blend them and get like kind of a cool blend, and that influences the sound of the vocal. Um, you know, uh, I love doing that, and I run it through Neves, and I run it through a Pultec, and get the vocal sounding great, and then I print it back in the box. You know, um, and and then you learn when you do that how Pro Tools delay compensation is a guess at best. Um, like when it prints stuff, it sometimes just puts stuff places. <laughs> well, that's weird. That thing, those are generally bugs, though, because that stuff should work. Or plugins that are not reporting correctly. Yes, or, well, that's true. There are a few outliers that are not yeah. good. Um, and then, you know, uh, I have a mix bus, uh, a two mix chain that I dig. And, um, you know, but it's been on my mind recently to to start to hybridize it. So I, you know, this is, and I'm sure this is. I don't know if you jumped both feet or if it's like now this is this used to be this and now it's this and it's kind of just changing and replacing and gradually moving. Yeah, it was wow. it was a process. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's part of the challenge, and then you also balance that with the constant challenge of like. I want to get this song done. I want to make sure that it sounds great. And I want to see my kids before they go to bed. Right. You know, and it's like, I, I used to be able to stay up until four in the morning screwing with stuff and I'm less inclined to do so. Yes. Um, which is the, you know, the blessing and the curse of doing something for a long time. Yeah. I don't know that it's a curse to not really want to stay up till 4am tweaking. I think that's no, just in the blessing category. Well, and that's, yeah, and I, I actually did find out that, like, you can, I can do a lot more work between eight and noon than I can between noon and eight. Yeah. Um, 
So that was good. That was a good discovery. Yeah, there are um, very, very few things that happen at 4 a.m. that are actually good the next day. I mean, there's some, you know, there's some, but not, I'd say yeah. less than half, certainly. Yeah, I think, I think so too. It's, uh, I've learned, and as I'm sure we all have to, when you're fighting something, the smartest thing you can do is walk away from it, right? Yep. Um, Cause you know, it's switch to another song. Next day obvious yeah. the next day like boom done there's actually a really interesting book called range that i'm reading right now that says that applies to a lot of different human endeavors that people who have a wide range of experience um and and uh deliberately switch will actually have better long-term successes and effects than people who just super narrow focus um, i'm very glad to hear that because that would be what i do yeah <laughs> so. Uh, so um yeah so that's the that's the super convoluted thing in the studio um there's still things that i like like i like guitars through la3as and i tend to like the analog la3as better than the digital la3as um even though again like the stuff that uad is doing and that Dirk's doing um, with Plugin Alliance and, and, you know, and then the other stuff that all of us use every day, like sound toys and fab filter and soothe um, is just, it's, it's a, it's an embarrassment of riches sonically, yeah. um, you know, and then every once in a while, I think, do I really need 300 EQ plugins? Yeah. I know. I mean, it's like it, the argument for mixing in the box is Chad Blake, and the argument for not using stuff is Al Schmidt. Like, what? What am I doing? Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's and that's funny. I've actually used that with students, and I was like, "Look, here's the deal. Andy Wallace mixed some unbelievable motherfucking records, and he used one EQ and one Dynamics plugin, and he used." a outboard compressor and maybe a reverb or a delay yeah and they're like what do you mean one eq i was like it's an ssl it's all the same eq it's all the same dynamics so maybe before you go crazy on all this shit just go buy metric halo's channel strip and challenge yourself to put it on every channel and mix the record yeah you know <clears throat> um not to I mention love having apparently that's the what other Serban stuff. does is puts metric halo on everything so yeah and you know his mixes don't suck at all fuck no <laughs> yeah and of he's course he's ass. and he's been in the box for years before chad yeah i don't i mean has yeah, he ever no. not been in the box as far as i knew he was in the box super early he has we actually co-mixed a couple of records back in the day um out of eden being one probably toby mac being the other and he was down in nashville and we were hanging out at uh at my studio but i mean i think even then i remember he was up at the he was up in the front in a little room that was all pro tools yeah um you know so he did do some stuff on the j and i know he did a bunch of stuff with teddy riley that wasn't necessarily in the box and and all of that stuff but uh um yeah he's, he's been in the box forever and his just a freak stuff of brilliant. nature he's yeah incredible yeah it's incredible fucker um, <laughs> I have a yeah I I haven't talked to him in a long time uh but uh yeah I mean I think my guess is what he's doing is he's taking multi tracks and pushing them into stems buses now folders whatever you want to call it um and that way when he's done since he knows that people are going to tear this apart 16 ways from Sunday you just print the fold you commit the folders and there's your mix um you know, I don't know. I'm still kicking around the idea of I like running the two mix through a little bit of analog sometimes, uh, you know, but it's all good. It's uh, keep inventing, right? Keep trying new things. Is yeah, the, is the exactly. Key. Exactly. You got to keep changing it up because otherwise then then if you don't, then the stuff becomes a crutch because you kind of forget. You feel like, oh, I'm not really doing anything. But no, you are because you've got 600 things that are always there. And if you don't change them you forget they're there and then they bite you in the ass and you can't figure out why stuff is the way it is because you've just forgotten. I mean, I did this yeah. happened to me today, you know, with all my parallel drum shit that's in my template. I'm like, man, I cannot get the drums to do this thing. What is going on? I'm not doing anything. I'm like, well, yes, I am. I'm doing a ton of stuff to the drums yeah. just because I routed them the way I usually do. 
right. all the routing okay there you go so yeah look this is the most i have ever spoken to a guest about gear and i feel bad doing that so i think we should bring in mark <laughs> who will ask you questions from the chat which will be about gear cool does that sound like a good thing sounds great all right it's been super awesome and i cannot wait to pour a shit ton of beer down both of our throats yes in me too. either country and like that me too and i, w I wish i wish you and your family uh health and happiness in this crazy time and uh thank you, you sir know, and the same to you hopefully we'll be out of it soon right yeah soon soonish well you're already out of it apparently so that's good well they are i'm yeah. i'm kind of avoiding that shit but uh yeah yeah, yeah we'll see did yeah. you by the way have you been vaccinated i have had my first shot i have Me too. but they uh in the uk they're doing three months between shots so i got like another five or six weeks to wait for the second oh wow one. wow crazy yeah. all right well man thank you so much it, it, it's really gratifying i'm a huge fan of you and and the stuff that you do and and i really do look forward to hanging well thank you very much and all that nice stuff you said was bullshit but i really appreciate you saying it it's <laughs> imposter <awesome>. syndrome <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel so much better it's great yeah. why can't engineers take compliments i'm terrible at it no we're yeah I, and i think this goes back to what i was saying before about why the imposter syndrome is worse it's because it's like i can't take credit for the record i didn't play on it i'm not the artist it's like it's nothing yeah. to do with me just lucky enough to get to like get my name on it and not yeah. mess it up right right so yeah yeah well you have not messed up a shitload of stuff dude so well, congratulations thank you very much i'll just say thank you, there you and, go. and same to you thank you <laughs> all right mark <laughs> quick before this gets uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> too late <laughs> hey hey man good to see you good to see you this has been great Getting to hear all the, the cool reads. And see, you, you're awesome. good at talking about yourself. Uh, let's bring in the guy with hair. <laughs> and now it's time for the guy with hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you're supposed to they at least were, pretend I've got hair. request for another hat. Come on. <laughs> Done. Yeah, yeah, but no beard. This is a wig. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that, that would be awesome. It That'd really be would be. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> Rita, I still have my, uh, my beard from our Between Two Beards show. Between Two Beards? nice yeah my paper beard I, it's not here though normally it's right there but yeah that's right i think Another you time. put it on when we talked to vance though didn't you to vance yeah yeah good times okay <laughs> um so how this works reed as you probably remember we're on a uh platform called crowdcast in addition to youtube and facebook and all that um right. if you guys have questions for reed uh head over to the crowdcast page you can find it on puremix.net there's a, a link to andrew's show at the top and uh, you can submit your questions there we uh, have a system where uh, people in chat room can upvote each other's questions and we start with the most upvoted and work our way down so uh, starting with our first most upvoted question from the audioist uh, he says, hey, Andrew and Reed, I'd like to ask the age old question. What defines the Nashville sound in your opinion? Is it the song or the production values or both? You know, anymore, I, I wonder what you mean when you say Nashville sound. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I think that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Does that, is the Nashville sound like the stuff that Dave Cobb is doing because he's he's crushing great records out of his studio here and they sound nothing like um like Hardy or Low Cash or even Dirks or, or are we talking about Kelsey Ballerini um because she's totally Nashville are we talking about Casey Musgraves um you know uh are we talking about Kings of Leon are you only going to name bands that start with K that's a little yeah. weird so, oh, that is actually the answer to the question yeah <laughs> yeah you yeah. got to start with k yeah. well okay so but i think you're absolutely right now but let's talk like traditionally though that really was a thing right let's say maybe 15 years ago or so yeah or even going all the way back to what brought bob dylan here to do a record and i think that that yeah. sound is really great players on the floor playing together yeah it's um, live band yeah. it's live bands it's live bands um, but not, you know, it's live bands with ringers. 
who are listening to each other um, and playing against each other and uh, and doing it in a way that seems effortless, which is incredibly hard to do. So there is a level of musicianship here that that I'm always humbled when I'm in the studio with these guys because you're just like, seriously, like here's a song. It's a four and a half minute song. There's this incredibly articulate acoustic part. They run it down once and the acoustic guitar player goes, man, can I just grab like the third bar of the bridge? I think something was a little off. He plays that and he's like, all right, let me double it. He plays it again. Four and a half minutes later, it's doubled. There's no fuck ups. It's perfect. And you're just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? So those guys are able to, to, to run a song and make it feel good, even though they haven't sat there and rehearsed it and they haven't overthought it. Or maybe that's the trick is they don't overthink it. They just play it. Yeah. I think also, and I'm making this up as I say it, but going back to what we were talking about before with like the Muscle Shoals guys and the Motown records when they were still in Detroit. So there was a very small group of musicians who played most of those records. And even once they moved out to LA, there was a small group of musicians. It's it's like that, but with a gigantic pool of musicians in mm -hmm. a way. It is it is very much like, I mean, obviously all of those guitar players play differently, but they're within a category of guitar players who are going to come in like oh that dude's not available all right cool we'll we'll get this other guy not that they're interchangeable and i'm not demeaning or diminishing what they do but it, it's like 25 muscle shoals all in the same city with slightly interchangeable parts in a way i just made yeah that up. I, I mean it, it's and i guess that's the nashville sound um you know i'm and i'm 100 percent fine with that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but now well, i mean as look, you alluded when, to when i got out of school if if i was going to go to nashville to work it was like it was nashville new york or la and nashville was going to be country even though there was other stuff going on there but right. now that's just not true at all i mean there is still that perception up. though i think a lot of people still think everybody wears 10 gallon hats here you know and uh and that's fun you know i mean it's the it's the one of the homes of country music so like yeah grab it Rock yeah it. yeah but you're not that far from memphis either no not that far from memphis not that far from muscle shoals muscle shoals muscle shoals is actually closer it's only like a two-hour drive right yeah so yeah it's a great place to be also you know the other reason why nashville has a lot of stuff going on is it's like it's a day's drive of 50 percent of the population of the country so everybody likes to tour out of here I don't know if that you were, answers You were question. kind of saying earlier, too, though, it, like the sound, it keeps changing, right? Like you've seen it change a couple of different times now, yep. many times, right? So that's that's another thing is like uh, as time goes on, it just keeps on evolving, it seems. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's a new, I mean, there's a new crew that came in with the track guy thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, it used to be that people were writing demos on an acoustic and then they would go into the studio and cut the demo. Now people are building tracks like a pop record. And that's what's starting a lot of these songs. And then we're going in and layering stuff over the tracks. Right. Did your camera yeah. just die, Mark? I think it did. And I think it was a gruesome death. <laughs> <laughs> well, it went to, uh, it see. went to crazy, like Vaseline on the lens focus and then uh, disappeared. Well, I might have had Vaseline on the lens. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you and okay. you and Barbara Streisand. Why not? Speaking, yeah, speaking of Vaseline, <laughs> that song that song almost made my playlist too, man. I love the way that record sounds. Nice. Okay, uh, hold on one second. I got to do a little pivoting here. Um, I'm going to ask the next question, and while you guys answer, I'll try to sort out what happened. All right. Um, stand by. I bet Fab recommended that camera, That's didn't he? Nice question. Yeah, he's probably just hacking into it. He may have. Yeah. I will say this, Andrew, on the analog side of things, mm -hmm. I have some of my some of my gear in the cloud, uh, on that access analog thing, and uh, it's kind of fun, um, you know, to just run a vocal through a ten fifty eight. Right. <laughs> and then just print it and be done. Nice. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of That's shit. The, there's no excuse anymore, ever. Yeah. 
which is a yeah, shame. It's, true. it's pretty <laughs> awesome that you're using your own gear in the cloud, right? <laughs> that's amazing. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't think it was going to be as cool as it was, and it ended up being super cool, right? Um, yeah. And it's it's kind of convenient to be like, ah, I'm going to give a little weird character to this. Boom, there it is. Great, got it, done. Great. Okay, um, well... Things are pretty fun over here right now because my uh, my mouse has apparently died as well. <laughs> Which is great. It sounds like you've got a USB problem. Yeah, I think all your things are fine. fine. And your, yeah, right. Your, your hub is dead. Systems are the failing. fun part of that is that I can't get to the next question. Um, so, Andrew, <laughs> do you have access to the Crowdcast page? Yes, yes, I do. I just give all me right. one second. Uh, and okay. I will ask the questions. This is very, very weird. Uh, hold on. Okay. Okay. So I need to enter the Crowdcast. Come on. It's loading. Let me in. All right. Andrew, do you have access to the Crowdcast page? <laughs> right. oh, I see you found it. I found it. Now, how do I mute this tab? I uh, got it. Okay. Probably a mute button somewhere in the player. Um, all right. So okay. here we go. Next question. Hey, Reed, Andrew, and Fab. He's asking Fab. Fab's not even here. That's some right bullshit. Uh, thank you for being here today. What do you think is the main aspect, part slash element slash piece of the pie, etc., of a home studio that most people trying to record overlook or don't understand? And if they knew this, their home studio productions might sound better and be in a higher, more competitive level. Acoustics. Like, I, I see a lot of pictures of check out my studio on Instagram. And it's speakers up against a drywall wall in a square room, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's just like... You know, that speaker placement might look good for Instagram or it might maximize the space in the room, but I guarantee you it sounds like shit. Uh, and if you're making music and you're not paying any attention to how the music is reproduced as you make it, you're not going to really make good music. I mean, you might get lucky. I think Andrew will agree that, you know, studio design, there's there's a fair amount of luck in it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but. I, I see a lot of people listening. I mean, you can have a really nice set of speakers. Oh, I got Prox, I got ATCs, I got PMCs, I got Amphians, whatever. In a crappy sounding room, it doesn't matter. You're still not hearing the right stuff. So it's smart to learn a little bit about how to treat a room, knowing that the low end is a function of the size of the room and the, and the way it's made. And the high end is a function of absorption and diffusion. Um, learn a little bit about that and look at options. And some of the options are just using Trinoff um, or a variation thereof. What's the, what's the app? There's an app that does uh, that. Sonarworks. Too, right? Yeah. Sonarworks. I mean, the Trinoff thing is incredibly powerful and it does all, all kinds of interesting Kung Fu. Um, but, you know, making sure that you're hearing the right thing and get a pair of headphones that you trust. Yeah. So that you can double check that you're hearing the right thing. Yep. Do you do a lot of mixing on headphones, Andrew? Tons, actually. Yeah. Because you're wearing what, your studio uh, on your head. Yeah. What uh what cans are you using right now? Just cheap Sony's. I'm used to them. Seventy five oh sixes. Yeah. I don't even know what to say about that because they're not good, but I love them. Yeah. And you can hear you can hear sub no problem you feel what the low end is doing so yeah i'm very seldom surprised and That's... i think a, a really tiny shitty pair of speakers is important too i use the imac built-in speakers um because yeah. then you stop worrying about things like the low end and you actually hear your balance and stuff like that that's yeah that's a good point um i i make it a point to make sure that i'm not always mixing on a pair of speakers that my head is in between. I like stuff over across the room. Like I've got some stuff over here on the side. Um, I think it's important to consider mixing through iMac or even MacBook speakers because especially if you're, if you're doing stuff for film and TV, everyone is listening through their MacBook Pro speakers, period. And that's it. Um, 
you know, I mean, I guess we could listen through iPhones, but it's starting to get a little ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, and it's not it's not because you're mixing for that format. It's because a great mix sounds great on shitty speakers. Period. True. It does. Back True. in black sounds good everywhere. Do you ever get sometimes I get paranoid that like I hear a classic mix. Like I was listening through the playlist thing that I was doing the other day. And there were a couple of classic mixes that I was like, this doesn't sound that good. Am I making this up in my head? Like, or am I going way too far with it? The, and then the whole like circle of yeah, yeah. circle of doubt gets going. Um, but yeah, I mean, a consistent reference. It's funny that you say that about the Sony headphones because I have spent thousands of hours listening to 7506s, thousands. Exactly. And I don't know why I don't have a pair in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> do they, they don't still make them, do they? Oh, yeah. 200 bucks oh. on Amazon. Absolutely. Yeah. They still make them new. I mean, because if you use them a lot, they'll wear out after a year or so. And, you know, so yeah. you just just get more. And the reason I always had them, because they're great in a tracking setup, because they're comfortable, they're light, but they're closed, and they're bright enough that you don't have to crank the click to the point where it's going to bleed. It's yep. just that yep. simple. And vocalists love them because they're bright, just easy to hear stuff. And for me, until like a week ago, I was mixing on my Tannoys, which the top end sort of matched. So it wasn't crazy going back and forth. The golds. Yeah, the old yeah. SRMs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, super just, cool. just to go back to the, the question, if you're talking about a tracking studio, and we've talked about this on this show a couple of times, the most overlooked part of trying to set up a tracking thing by far is the headphone system. If you don't have good sounding headphones, people will not enjoy playing and then they won't get a good performance out of them, period. Yeah. And if you do have good sounding headphones, they're going to play that much better. And sometimes, especially for bands that aren't experienced, that means taking your nice Furman or whatever multi-channel headphone system and turning everything off, but two and sending them a good two mix yeah because if you've ever gone out into the studio and listened to what some people are listening to it's horrifying it's and they're never going to play well yeah yep. it is absolutely crazy town all right hey mark's nice. back he's back i am i'm back was it just it a simple a restart movie. it was yeah good and you were correct i had a little too much going on with the usb hub all right see he's got yeah. little speakers back there yeah yeah sir so, uh these are actually recommended by fab these are um <laughs> ilouds iloud threes i think nice that was a fab thing they're not plugged in usb though so i can't blame him for that one <laughs> <laughs> yes you can okay uh yeah just do it he's not here <laughs> okay um so next uh most upvoted question from michael graham uh, he asks, how is your SSL modified? And talked about this a little bit already, but do you mix uh, any completely in the box? And if so, what's the biggest thing you miss from out of the box? Um, I do mix stuff completely in the box. Uh, how is my SSL modified? I have no idea. I've got some brown EQs, some black EQs, a couple of mass select EQs, which are kind of fun. Um, the the quad bus compressor sounds really cool and i don't know anything other than it feels like it sounds cooler than other ones i've used it's all a feel thing man i don't know the you know the only thing i miss the only thing i miss a lot being in the box is sometimes you can pull stuff especially on drums i can pull stuff up on the ssl and it's like boom like ah yes there it's working and uh in the box i feel like well, i gotta fight that or i gotta try that or man it's not working and you know i try another thing and then you can also go down the rabbit hole of i have 347 dynamics compressors i wonder what those sound like on the parallel you know instead of when you're on a console it's like here's the compressors they're there you're done right you're done like pair of distressors on the parallel using the quad bus compressor all right this is what it is um so that's, you know, I, I don't have any crazy, Vance has all the crazy special Cappy modded mix buses and all that stuff on his SSL and it sounds awesome. And, <clears throat> you know, Jeff's done some really cool stuff with that. 
Um, mine is mine is just kind of running stock or stock ish. I'm sure we upgraded it at some point. Um, well, but you should talk about your power supply upgrade since you actually started a company to make and sell them. Oh yeah, there's that thing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I did. I was a I was a co-founder of Atomic Instrument, and uh, and that helped it use a lot less power and run cleaner and run quieter. And, and that was, that was kind of genius. I mean, Norman, Norman's design on that was super genius. And you so, managed yes. to sell them to TLA, Bob Clear Mountain, Tom Elmhurst, you know, some slouches, but they bought them. You do. Yeah. Them. A bunch of, a bunch <laughs> of cool dudes. I get off on the fact that Bob Clear Mountain, first of all, that Bob Clear Mountain, I think in, in maybe some tiny little way might know who I am. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, that he runs his studio on solar because of that power supply, you know, wow. or in part because of that power supply. I think that's pretty cool. That's very cool. Yeah. All Are right. He's going to leave that out. What? That that whole thing. You you weren't going to mention that. That's tomorrow. why I'm here. You're just, you're just it's gonna, why I'm here. Just leave it out. I'm an idiot, man. Like I I don't I don't I don't. That shit does not roll through my head I, I i'm in here like worried about am i gonna is this song gonna work for the thing that it blah 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 like you know i i'm i'm kind of an idiot that way that's awesome that's why are you okay um uh next one is also from michael uh what is the one piece of gear you wish you had a plug-in version of and this is the good part the plug-in you wish you that was actually outboard gear um, well, currently the plugin that I wish was outboard gear is the magic death eye compressor. Um, because even the, though I don't, didn't he make hardware that he did? It is, but I don't yeah. have it. Right. Well, and come they're, on. They're, they're nearly unobtainium. All uh, right. Um, hmm. but I, I really like that plugin and I don't ever use it really for compressing. Um, but I really dig it. Uh, what do I want that's outboard gear that's a plug-in? You know, there's a couple things. One of them is this box called a Bedini Audio Spatial Environment, a bass. And it was this, it's this weird, it's it's not weird. It's just some kind of 3D thing that was made by some crazy person who also sold, like, you know, I think things that clean CDs to make them sound cleaner. I don't know. Um, but this thing sounds really awesome. And I really like the way it sounds on stuff. And, and uh, that's one thing that I, I can't, I, I can't get in the box, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I also have this, uh, a BA 25 RCA made a compressor called a BA 25 and it sounds awesome on bass, and that doesn't really exist in the box. Yeah, you can glom a bunch of things together and sort of get close to it. But, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like trying and it's good and the bass is still bugging me. I don't know. And I switch back to the BA25 and it's like, boom. And I was like, ah, oh, great. Fine. I'll just use that. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Andrew, I think uh, got to give you this one as well. Oh, what? I, I have to answer this now? I had all that time to think about it and yeah. I didn't. Um. <laughs> uh what gear do i wish there were plugins for i don't know because i mean i can't i can't have an answer to that question because then i would be saying like well my mixes would be better if i had something i don't have and i can't <laughs> do that 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 would be really weird but they it should be different yeah yeah I'm trying oh, i'll to tell you one and you may have this mm -hmm. i know he's not listening because he doesn't listen to anybody. Massenberg. Oh, he's release listening. Release your fucking release your compressor, dude. Like release the compressor. <laughs> release the Kraken. Yeah. It's awesome. It was awesome like 5 years ago. Yeah. Um I lost the asset for it or I I don't know, it's on an old iLock somewhere. I should probably go digging for it or it got it died or whatever, but um George's compressor is amazing on vocals and the plug-in compressor which he still isn't happy with was awesome years yeah. ago it's yeah. killer so it, do you still have it andrew i actually have a time limited authorization that i've not triggered yet because i know if i do 
I'm going to use it on everything and then it'll disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't, I can't, that just sounds like a bad, bad idea. I think for me, <laughs> like to answer the question, like my, the difference to me between being in the box and out of the box there, I mean, there are things that have character. Like I still, I kept my BA6A because it, it's broken. Like I've never found another one that sounds anything like it, but it's amazing. But I don't use it while I'm mixing because it's like, well, yeah, it does something that nothing else does, but it's not something that you have to do. You can always just do something else. So what I love about the stuff outside, like my modular, is that I'm patching and there's no screen and I can't check email and I can't hit save. And if I like it, I got to print it somewhere. And if I don't like it, I pull all the patches and start over. But I don't want that to be plugins. I've messed with all of the different mm -hmm. modular software systems, and they're amazing. And a lot of the modules are digital, so it's identical in the box. But that's not why I like my modular. But I can't mix that way. So there's nothing really that I wish were outboard for mixing. I mean, I wish the control services map to things a little better, because sometimes it is great to just grab knobs, because you know where they are. But other than that, no. So I'm going to skirt the question. Well, you know, and, and uh, Mark, you know, part of this is the, the rack that I have that's in the cloud with access analog, right? Like, that's both, because there mm -hmm. aren't plugins for, for Neve 1057s or 1058s or 1064s. And, okay. um, you know, I use that stuff or, or the Altec, which there is a plugin for that. But, you know, when you slam stuff through analog gear, it does horrible things to audio, which are so much fun. And being able to do that and then just printing it, and it's like, okay, I just did this horrible thing to audio. And now the drums sound like whatever they sound like. Um, and if you don't like it, you just turn it off, right? And you can use something else. Yeah. But if you do like it, it's it's kind of a cool character or it's an inspiration to try something else or to do something yeah. else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's the benefit. I don't think I'd be able to resist a BA6A that does something that nothing else does if only just to print through it and render it, you know, like commit yeah. it and be done. Well, see, but I had, I had the benefit of when I moved into the box, I like my Neve turned into like the worst laptop stand ever. It was just fucking horrible. And I had one power yeah. supply on to use the monitor section and that was it. But when I moved to England, all the gear went to a studio that was an hour away. So kind of partnering with them. And whenever I was tracking, I'd go down there and use it. And it was amazing, but it wasn't in the house. Yeah. So I got, re and it's a, the switch flipped. I didn't, I haven't bought a piece of gear since then, except for some, a couple of modules for the module, like all of that constant looking and acquiring and wanting to build it up. And it all just stopped. It completely mm. stopped. And then when the studio closed mm. and I had to sell everything, I kept my BA6A, a pair of 1176s, a BCM10, but almost all of that stuff is rented to somebody who's got a small tracking room. Uh, yeah, it's not even here. It's not here. No, that's, I mean, that, mm. and that's, I, I, maybe I need to go down that path. Like my. No, because you've got something that actually worked. The only reason you would need to go down that path is if you were still sitting there with mixes on the console losing money constantly and unable to feed yourself because sure. that's not the way people work anymore i meant more like i i should buy uh ethereum and not magic death eye stereo mastering composers. well see but this but part of my <laughs> thing was i never bought anything new which sucks because there's so much great new stuff like magic death eye and all that but i never did it because it was always like i had to justify it as an investment as well yeah uh, i will say this mark you know what's badass gear that doesn't exist in plug-in form is the spectrosonic stuff and oh yeah i i would really love to have a plug-in version of 610s well and i've talked yeah. to bill about that and i think the problem is that the time constant on the limiter is so fast that you can't you'd have to be working at 192 to even get close yeah. to being able to do it right yeah, that's what he was saying. And I actually, I, I talked to him too. And I was like, who cares? Yeah, put the, put the thing out because I'll <laughs> slam drum rooms through it. And, you know, like it'll still be a vibe, even though it's not going to be that vibe. Yeah, um, it'd be the character you know, of it. That's um, true. But yeah, I mean, he's super, I, right. Bill's awesome. And I love the, I love the stuff. And, you know, I would love to have it around to play with. 
Yeah. Next question. Those are those are on my uh, my gear, like my outboard wish list. That's like number one up at the top. Oh, and also, come on, Thomas. Let's get this Rupert Neve design shit in Pro Tools already. Come on. <laughs> chop, chop. <laughs> awesome. Okay. That's um, the way to get Just uh, real quick. Reed, I'm going to I'm going to plug your access analog thing a little bit um, for for anybody who doesn't know what that is uh, and correct me if I'm saying it wrong, but plug um, it, I'm going to go pee. There you go. It's a <laughs> here's a plug for a plug in of a hardware thing. If you have this thing in Pro Tools, uh, basically you you put it on a track just like it's a plug in and it's streaming audio to a rack of outboard gear um, that's not at Reed's place, but somewhere. And you get to turn the knobs and there's little robot arms that go and do what you're doing with the plugin, stream it back to you. You can print that stuff. So it's a way to, to use some of Reed's gear. And I put the um, uh, little button in the chat room for you guys to go to check it out if you want to. But you go on there and just reserve the gear for a little while. I think it's like it works in blocks of times and nice. And you can try some stuff out. He's got some pie limiters on there that are interesting. So very cool. Fun. Yeah. Should I show them my toothpick okay. again? Are we at that point? You'd probably do the toothpick. Here's, yeah. There you go. Get you an extreme close up. Nice. Uh, I might have. I might have missed this earlier. Um, Stefan's asking, "Where can I find your solo music? Did you guys? Does Reed have some solo music? I don't know. About? Maybe. All right. We'll, we'll have to ask happens. him. Yeah. Okay, there's a uh, business question coming up for both of you. We could oh, do your shit. part of it now. No, no, wait, you wait. wait you, you have to read it again. All right. If we don't wait. Yeah. It's in my contract. I only read things once. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> Somebody says, wait, what? Robot? Sorry. Arms? What? That That's was, right. uh, was going to get dire. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get serious in a second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Read the next question that's the most upvoted is from Stefan, and he says, where can I find your solo music? Is there some solo music out there? Solo music? Yeah. Um, you can't, and there's really good reasons for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. Well, Stefan in the chat wants to hear it. He's not uh, up I, I don't know that it exists. Cool. All right. Uh, the next question is a business question from Rico T., and he says, hey, Andrew and Reed, is it necessary for an audio engineer to find a manager? I always hear engineers on here talk about their managers. Is it something that'll happen organically in your career? Or is it something you should seek out? Or do we even need one? Thank you. I, I think the easy answer to that question is if you're asking whether you need one, you don't need one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's management is a definite double-edged sword it's amazing for certain things it's it's not amazing for other things um but you you will know when you get to the point where you need management because you're spending too much time dealing with stuff other than being creative and that's not a good use of your time so I, that's how i would answer that i think yeah my first meeting with Frank McDonough, who's been my manager now forever, and he's a great guy. I love the he's fact awesome. that he's my manager. And the very first thing he said is, look, man, I'm not going to get your work. But, and that's the truth. Now, the truth is there has been work that's come to me because of his relationships with other people, and they would send him some say, hey, who on your roster would be good for this? So there have been a few things, but that's not the gig. The gig is... First of all, to do the stuff that takes up time, like the invoicing and all chasing up invoices and royalty calculations and all that kind of stuff when royalties were a thing. I just had to say that, but you know, it doesn't mean shit now. But right. really, he, for me, he's someone who helps me manage my career. It's like, look, can I turn this down? Can I really say no? Because something smells funny about it. I don't think I want to get involved, but should I do it? Or I'd really like to do this and I'm terrible at self-promotion. Can you please find somebody to do like an email mm -hmm. intro so that I can then talk to a band that I love to see if there's any way to work together because I can't do that myself. So 
that kind of stuff they're invaluable for but yes if you are asking if you need one then you don't need one because if you did you would have one and that sounds like a really weird thing to say but it is true yeah and you're so lucky to have frank i i remember i had a meeting with him ages ago in la and he's just the coolest dude yeah like he's, he's fantastic yeah yeah. And there are a lot of different, I mean, you know, should I have a manager? Like there's no, all managers are different. So it's, you can't even answer that question really. Yeah. You hit an important, important part, which I think is the conception that uh, a manager is going to go out and find you a bunch of work and keep you busy. No, if you don't already have work and that's not, yeah. no, work, everything whatever. is word of mouth in some way. Um, yep. it really is. I mean, look, and, and I, I'm not going to, to be completely honest, when you're visible, like I've made myself incredibly visible. I mean, forget about even the mixing work, but like doing this show and plugins and the videos and things like that. Lots of other stuff will start to come in because of that. Like they see me talk about something and I say, yes, I do indie records because I do all the time. Well, that's another hundred people who will now email with an indie project that they want me to have a look at and frank for those is my filter as well he'll gather information about the projects and kind of lay them out so i don't have to spend three days waiting through them i can actually go through them and see like which of these things might, might be interesting to me whatever so it's invaluable i mean it's it's really really great but it, it's not five years ago that didn't exist you know there was nobody coming to me out of the blue because i did a video on the internet because i hadn't done any well, I guess 10 years yeah. ago, whatever. Well, whatever. It, it's a, it's an ROI thing, you know, like it, here's the thing that for a couple of years, I co-taught a class for my old school um, that was designed for music business students, but it's really designed for everything. And, and uh, we called it a minor in reality. And it was, here's what you actually need to know if you're going to survive in the music business. Cause a lot of the stuff they teach you in school doesn't actually matter. And one of them is congratulations. You're a startup you're a CEO, you're running a business, right? So what you're really asking about when you ask about a manager is, does it make sense for me to pay someone to do things so that I can do other things? What is the return on investment on that, right? Yeah. If your your time is worth something, your time is worth, I don't know if it's 10 bucks an hour or a thousand bucks an hour, but it's worth something. And if you can be doing something for a thousand bucks an hour and pay somebody else a hundred bucks an hour to do stuff, don't burn your time on the hundred dollars an hour stuff. That's when you need a manager. That's a great way to, to put it. Because I mean, it is, you are employing somebody basically. Yeah. And, and if you want to expand on the, treating your career as a business check out i can't remember if it was part one or part two but tony maserati that's a big part of how he assesses his career and he has like mm -hmm. yearly reviews of his own career with himself to decide whether or not strategies are working and come up with what he's going to do for the next year <coughs> yeah he's a super smart dude yeah um i'm gonna i'm gonna throw a little thing in here for um anybody who's on the on the invoicing side of things and and really like a lot of the the day-to-day -day stuff of dealing with paperwork or whatever chasing after money there's so many tools that are available now too that can help out with that I mean there's a, a free bookkeeping software that I use online called uh, wave app and Me that too. one yeah you can I mean I do everything through there I and that includes like letting customers pay their invoices online because I'm willing to pay the credit card fee for the ease of not having to find another way to get them to send payments and the time that that takes and all that stuff. And it'll send auto reminders and that kind of stuff. So there's, there's so many tools out there just with Zapier and stuff like wave app and all that, that you can really kind of take yeah. all of that stuff that a manager would do when your career is not at the point of having to filter through a hundred mix requests and Kind of and and sometimes it expedited. makes sense to spend money to make your life easier. It's like the it it's not smart to drive thirty miles to a store because something is a dollar cheaper there. Like you right. got to do the math on all aspects of it. What you're doing and your time is a valuable commodity. Yeah, everybody everybody fails to realize that their time has value, um, and that's that's something you have to keep first and foremost and yeah we, we use wave app we use wave for the transfer company like it's great and i think there's 
and I don't know the name of it. There's another company now where you can do work and you put the work up. And when, once it's approved, when the client pays, then they can download the work. Yeah, there are a few different right? companies mm-hmm. doing that. Which yeah. is super cool. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's good stuff out there. Uh, one person in the chat managed um, CRM tools. So those are like customer relationship management things. Those are great to check out too. Dude, you know what? And I'll, I'll throw this out there and everybody knows where to find me or Andrew, you might have this answer. I have yet to find a good CRM that I connect with because i'm i'm legendary for like going to la right and then posting on my instagram when i get back love to see in la and having 13 people be like dude why didn't you hit me up and i was like oh fuck i didn't even i forgot you were you know like you were out there i'm dying for a good crm that helps for follow-up if anybody has a suggestion it's great because a lot of the ones are so hardcore on sales funnels and you know i mean like targeted marketing that that's not what i need i just need hey idiot when you go to la make sure you like swing by dude's place yeah i think the the closest I like uh oh, sorry go ahead mark oh i i like pipe drive i don't know if you've seen that one but... lavicious lavicious name but i'll check it out <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i have not found anything like that but my favorite sort of organizational tool right now is called ClickUp, and it's really like for software development or whatever but it is awesome it's like having a board full of post-it notes that you can just drag all over the place and recategorize hmm. okay i'll look into that I, I messed with it i messed with it a little bit and didn't connect with it but that was a while ago so I'll yeah look back it, at it changes fast they they they're developing really really quick cool Awesome. Okay. Uh, shifting gears back. Uh, how are you guys doing on time? Want to do one or two more? Or yeah, a couple do, more. Do a couple more. Yeah. So I told cool. you we get you to All four right. hours. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, so next one's from Michael Beer, and he says, "Hi, Reed and Andrew. What are your approaches with reverbs in parallel compression buses? Like the rear bus, for example. Uh, the content's amazing. Thanks a thousand times over." Uh, I mean, my approach for reverb is usually when I need something to sound reverberant. Um, you know, that's a hard question to answer. Like, I, do you think, is he asking like philosophically? How do you well, approach Well, I think, oh, I mean, saying, um, he mentions the, the rear bus okay. thing. So like for me, there, there's this stereo bus that is everything except the drums. It's like an extra mix bus and that gets blended back in. The reverb returns from things some of them go into the rear bus and some of them don't the ones that go into the rear bus are the ones i couldn't hear enough so i put them in the rear bus because now they're louder it really it's that simple there's no theory about it and the i think that the way to think about it is not to worry about the fact that they're reverbs they're just another audio signal and it's do you want to make things even messier by adding another audio signal to a parallel compression chain because it'll make stuff more glued together and more exciting, or do you not want it to be as messy and you're okay to give up on whatever that would be? But that's the same whether it's the snare drum or the reverb or a vocal, or it doesn't matter what it is. So Andrew, a question on you, since you've got all those things, all those things mushing together, how do you print stems? I don't, it's a shitty, I solo things and do it in passes, but I've written sound flow apps that do it for me while I sleep. Right. Like the bounce Butler thing or whatever. And it's, then I, the guy does bounce Butler's awesome, but it's slightly different, but it's, it's getting really, really cool. This thing I'm doing. I know I I'm, I've been, I just. Well done. Well yes, done, sir. Hey. Although we All did right. notice yeah. something where like, you know, when you do your plugin search, you like you click on the insert, and you do a text search on plugins when that thing is yeah. connected, yeah. that yeah. is not happening. So I was like, disconnect. T- well, turn okay. Off. Okay. It. So that is a known <laughs> Pro Tools bug and Avid. It's got it on their list and we're pushing them and hopefully they will fix it because it, it's it's not soundful that breaks it, it's accessibility. So if you are using voice control, it does the exact same thing. It's using oh, accessibility. Gotcha is what breaks the menus. It's all the, the newfangled gray menus are what breaks. So, so I, I, but, I wanted to follow up on what you said yeah. and then expand on it. Like the soup, the the pumping it through all this parallel compression or whatever that kind of knits stuff together. 
kind of screws you when you print stems because yeah. now all of a sudden everybody's Completely. talking to everybody else and yeah yeah i got gotcha. you um you know the other thing to, to remember about reverb is if you're just sending to a reverb or a delay and bringing it back into the mix you're missing a whole lot of fun stuff right i love sending stuff through reverbs and then the reverb goes through distortion goes through a crystallizer goes through like a lo-fi plugin um, I've also found anecdotally that if I roll, I put lo-fi on my reverb returns and I take them down to like 36 K well, like one step down from 48 or whatever we're at, um, and add a little distortion, they sound cooler. And it's the same thing as pushing it through a parallel bus and giving it a little more mojo. So I also like, I have a folder now that has like 12 different effects on it and it's being fed from one send on the lead vocal so i can pull up a song throw that send up who the hell knows what's going to happen it might be cool or it might not and then i can go through all of them bam 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 and start looking for combinations that might work really well for this verse or really well for the chorus or whatever having all of those there allows you to move intuitively and do what sounds good instead of sitting there and going, you know, I should really have a reverb. Maybe I should put Valhalla plate on it. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I should try this. And then all of a sudden you're trying the 16 plates that you have, right? Just have the, you know, have the Echo Boy, Echo Cat, UAD, Capital Chamber, like the, your, you know, one, 250, whatever the hell it is. Like just have that stuff up there so you can just bang through it um, really quick. That's, that's really, really useful. Yeah. I love the one send idea. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually there's usually two, there's the one main send and then there's the one like this will kick on in the chorus and throw something like bigger up or make them make a moment. But the one send thing works really well because sometimes you hit like a down verse and you want it to just go dry one send, you know, automated done instead of going through a, a million, a million different ones. Um, what was the, there was a two part to that question. I don't remember what the second part was. No, that was it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andrew, I think uh, a cool idea for another one of your sound flow scripts might be a uh, slot machine for the inserts. <laughs> <laughs> you and you and Ricky T bump on this. Randomize you get back your whole like random. Yeah. 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 I don't know what's going to happen when I pull up the song because that's how the analog thing was. <laughs> You know, that's funny. So what are you coding those in, Andrew? Well, SoundFlow is, uh, it's JavaScript. Okay. Yeah, I have a, I have a list of things that, that um, our intern is going through and making like little scripts for. Uh, and I think it's going to be really, it's going to be really cool. It's, it's genius. But look, and the, the breaking the type ahead search thing is not a small deal. So I get it. But when you click the menu, just hit S return and now you're in search. So that's one way to very quickly get back to it. But also the sound flow built in search is actually better than the Pro Tools built in search. So I've got a button oh. to search for because it will search anywhere in the name and it's fuzzy. So if you just say EQ, you're immediately limiting to your EQ folder, and then you can type another word, and then you can type another word, and it just keeps narrowing down, as opposed to you having to spell things in the right order the way it was. So you can get around it. It is a pain in the ass, but you can get around it. I think it's just, it was it was one of those curveballs that I use so often, I don't Absolutely. even think about it. You know, and it was like, this isn't work. Uh, this is uh, no, 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 no. I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> the first time, the first time I launch Pro Tools every day, I know the type of head search works. And so I find myself trying to not use scripts because like, okay, it's still working. It's still working. It's still working. Oh, fuck. I ran a script. All right, cool. Now it's just S return, S return every time. Gotcha. Well, the thing that, that has most improved humanity as regards Pro Tools is the fucking counter offset thing, man. That thing is genius. Thank you very much. Now, Thank have you. you have you used the color palette? No. Check that one. Mm -mm. All right. You can name all your colors and you can select tracks by color. Oh. Man, I need I need more time geeking out with that program, like for real. Yeah. Uh, but the color yeah, palette's just... done. It's just an app like the offset counter. But I'm glad you I'm oh, glad okay. you like that. I use it yeah. every day. 
Dude, day. I'm so, so sick of, uh, let me like kind of scroll and highlight this or, you know, let me check the mix mm -hmm. and where does the zero start? Yeah, forget it. Yeah. So good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm just thinking of all the cool things you guys could do with a GUI for the randomizer with both of your faces on it. <laughs> <laughs> this could be really good. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. You guys kind of just talked about it. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add to it. Uh, it was, hey guys, can you two share how you deal with stems with all your parallel processing? Messily. Yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, stems are, stems are, we could have a three hour conversation on stems and how much they suck mm -hmm. and how much it sucks <laughs> that stems. somebody will get stems and then they'll fuck with the mix and put your name on it. Um, and how much I'm not a fan of that particularly. Uh, but the fact is that they are necessary, um, you know, sometimes and uh, you know, and that's a, I mean, I guess that's just a, that's a, an ancillary conversation, Andrew, about what you had about using outboard gear. Like you're still going to blend shit into like compressors and like make yeah. the whole soup yeah. thing. Although theoretically you could be like, all right, I'm not doing that. So all of my stems are super clean. I guarantee you that all of Serban's stems are super clean. Yeah. Well, just, he's, yeah. he does it in a different way, you know? Um, but that's not the way I I've, I've tried doing it. I just can't get stuff happy that way. So my stems do not add up to the mix. I never listen to my stems. I'm printing them because someone asked me to do it. So I've written a program to do it while I sleep. And that's the way that works. Uh, stems are a deliverable and I don't give a shit about them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, same I, a lot of times people would be like well we need stems for this project i'm like okay they're x amount of song however most people have found especially for live that they can actually take the multi-tracks take the stuff out that they don't want and then have the raw multi-tracks which is what you would be getting if you were playing them on stage anyway not something that was mixed so you might want to consider that and basically they're like yeah we don't want to spend the money and then i don't have to do the steps yeah so i haven't gotten people to pay for them for the most part just, Although more and more labels are starting to put them in turn, yeah. you know, required turn in. Yeah. Um, so, but that's why I wrote know. a program to do it. Cause and that's, that's in Soundflow. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. That'll be out that, that will be a product. Cause it's like, it's kind of ridiculous how cool it is. Cause you can set it up like in no time. You just keep selecting tracks and say, that's going to be a pass. That's going to be a pass. Do all those soloed individually. All right, cool. So you can set up like 50 passes in about a minute and then just hit go, which is, and go good. get a bite to eat. Yeah. Or go to sleep and it'll do it across multiple sessions. So you can do an entire record and it'll close in open sessions and add them to playlists and export them. And yeah. And then you get up the next morning and there's this error message. Error, DAE could not get audio fast enough. And then you just want to kill <laughs> Pro yourself. Tool, no, don't get that one. But Pro Tools does crash sometimes opening sessions. Altiverb is a pig for stuff like that, unfortunately. Fantastic plugin, but it causes problems sometimes. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one yeah. of the culprits, but it is a culprit. But right. yeah. Anyway, we digress. What if you added the randomizer to your stem script? <laughs> <laughs> then they would add up to something very different from the mix, which isn't what, what people are paying for, I guess. They're not going to know until they go on tour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They won't care. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last question for you guys. Um, All right. So this is, this is going to be fun because uh, you're in the middle of this, Andrew. Um, so Mike Paragon asks, what are your thoughts on this new push to do everything in surround? I see a lot of investment by some labels remixing their entire back catalog in Atmos, UMG with East Iris uh, in parentheses. Thoughts? Hi, Mike. What's going on, dude? Super good to hear from you, man. I hope you're well. Um, Andrew, you want to, I just want to say hi to Mike. You want to go for that first? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I am putting Atmos in this room. I will be mixing music in Atmos. So the holy grail for anyone who owns catalog is to be able to re-release the catalog so cds cassettes eight tracks every single new format was like amazing because they you would buy your record again 
Atmos is not quite like that because people don't buy anything anymore and these are all just streaming subscription-y things and whatever. What is What I like about it is that it has a binaural component and that it's object-based for the speakers. 5.1, you had to have a 5.1 setup to listen to it. It sucked if you were missing a speaker. That's bullshit. Nobody's doing that. And look, I'm going to have 16 speakers in this room. I'm not expecting people to have 16 speakers in their home. But if they even have four speakers or three speakers or whatever, they will get some of what I'm trying to do. And that will keep improving. The binaural version of it and the way it folds down, that's easy to improve because that's just algorithms. So that will get better and better and better and better. And the integration into Pro Tools is getting better, so it's not like this weird mindfuck trying to just make it work. It's becoming part of a Pro Tools mix flow, which I like a lot. And I'm really excited to do it because like Reed was talking about earlier about pushing stuff outside the speakers. There's so many engineers and Chad is definitely one of them. I'm one of them. We get so excited with the idea of holophonics and psychoacoustics and binaural, anything like that where you can put yourself in a sonic environment that's bigger than just two speakers. That's what this is. So I'm hoping for the best. I'm super excited about it. And it made me have a gigantic set of PMCs staring me in the face, which I am still just like, holy shit, these are amazing. So overall, I'm very positive. I'm hoping for the best. I I think it's it's an inevitable evolution. Um, I think we have to be careful to remember that Atmos isn't the only format. Um, so, you know, when we talk about as much as, as Carrie would like me to say that Atmos is the only format and you know what, they may end up being last man standing. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, but- Sony has a history of, losing out in the format wars that's their it's only soon only not yet (laughs) that's what that acronym stands for um yeah i mean there's right now there's three formats that i'm aware of um and there's also been a fairly interesting conversation between the film world and the music world as regards atmos um you know film guys have reasons to stick with bed tracks yeah um i'm curious uh andrew you said that you're gonna have 16 speakers in your room um are they all the same uh no they're three across the front are the same and the rest are also pmcs but they're obviously smaller but they're so pancakes they're the the yeah the wafer twos yeah so I've so, not and heard the difference, but but that said, just really quickly, and I would definitely want you to finish your point about it, but for me, everything that isn't at the front is secondary speakers anyway, because that's the way I will be mixing. I'm not going to try and have you sit in the middle of the band because that's ridiculous. Nobody sits in the middle of the band. So I will be building environments, and then there can be things that are flying around and really tricky, but they are not core elements of the song their ephemera so yeah i mean this this could be the subject of a whole conversation um i've thought a lot about atmos and it's something that i want to do as well um but to me not but but to me the the highest and best expression of an atmos system would be all the speakers being the same because then as you move things between objects they're moving, you know, to a similar reproduction thing. Um, and I, I get exactly what you're saying. And honestly, I think the stuff that, um, that Giles did with the, the Beatles stuff um, is a perfect example of using at least three main speakers or a, or a five, one kind of deal, and then filling in the rest. I thought it was masterful. Yeah. And Greg stuff Penny's stuff too is really great for that. Um. So, but I've thought a lot about it because it just it it occurred to me on a theoretical level that if if you're using object-based audio, it makes sense for all of the playback systems to be this actually the exact same reproducer, right? Yeah. 
Um, but I although think, again, that's a software tweak away from being. Yeah, but I think my my argument against that is that those are exactly the speakers that people listening to the stuff are not going to have. And so, if you're trying to move full range, like the vocals going in the back, it's just going to sound totally fucked up if they don't have the speakers and you're relying on full bandwidth speakers back there. So I actually like, and I, the, from what people have said, and I'm, I've not been able to sit in a room with this particular set of speakers in the front and then the rest are, around. From what everybody has said, the character of the speakers is similar enough that you can actually move between things. And as yeah. long as you're smart about your low end and to keep things consistent, it's actually, it works really well. And it's not this crazy, like, what the hell just happened moving from one thing to another but that said i want to build it where the front wall is a thing and then the surround is a thing and i'm but who knows once i actually start doing it that philosophy could change i have no idea i really don't yeah yeah and i think there's also a decent argument for saying that you may you may find yourself starting a lot of these mixes starting in binaural yeah yeah right um, yeah. Especially because you're used to working on headphones a lot, and then maybe then it changes to Atmos. I don't know. It's all up in the air, right? The film guys are really paranoid about it because you don't really know when you're in whatever playback room what those speakers are, and you could have something where you want it to be like right here, and but in that room it's like over here, and it's out of exactly. You know. But look, I mean, Netflix has been requiring Atmos for two years now, three years, something like that. Anyway, so you know. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Amazon too, I think now. So, yeah, and and you did say, and you may find yourself, and so I'd like to say that I may find myself in a shotgun shack. <laughs> 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 and I think I think that's that brings us to a natural end. There it is. That's a good close, <laughs> right? Reed, uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so thank much. You. Very thank good you. hang, and I do look forward to doing this in person on some side of the pond. As do I. And and we As shall do, do that. Um, so next week is the incomparable Steve Lipson, which I'm really looking forward to. That's going to be fucking nuts because that guy's made some records as well. Yeah. So that should be really good. Um, I think that's all I got. Anything you want to you wanna close on there, Reed? You good? No, I just, man, I appreciate the opportunity of being here and, and, uh, and Mark and Fab, wherever you are, like what you guys are doing at Pure Mix is is badass and, and it's, guillaume it's don't leave out guillaume. and guillaume yes. guillaume doesn't like to be mentioned but he is he's a big part yes. of it we guillaume, have to guillaume yeah. merci beaucoup um <laughs> great job guys thank you so much mark always thank great you. to see you yeah awesome you too mark Absolutely. thank you so much as always and um i thank guess you randomize the script coming soon watch out for it everybody <laughs> yeah yeah watch out for it <laughs> This is where right. I mute Mark's <laughs> microphone while we wave. Yeah. All right. <laughs> See you, everybody. Later.